meeting for our budget presentation. And as always, we'll start with Pledge of Allegiance. Moment, moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioners, I just got a uh, caller on the line. Do we want to go ahead and do that now? I don't, we don't have any public comments scheduled today. No. Mr. Yeah, Kyle, did you? Yeah, I, I could barely hear you, but you have a caller? That's correct, sir. We have a caller on the line. Uh, we don't typically do public comment, but would you like to go ahead and do that? There's no reason why we shouldn't. Correct. Sophia. Three minutes? Yes. Please. You got it. Caller, could you use star six to unmute? We have a caller online. Go ahead, caller. You'll have three minutes. Please identify yourself. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, this is Crystal Weinbrenner, executive director for Ride With Us. Um, I wanted to take a second. Thank you so much for allowing me to comment. I know this is out of the ordinary. Um, but I, I wanted to um, call in today and share my thoughts about the proposed transit cuts that you discussed in last week's session um, with Ms. Graham. Uh, first, I just think it's very important to explain that Carroll County, uh, transit in Carroll County is very different than any other county in the state. Uh, other counties require their passengers to qualify for services. We offer transportation to everyone in Carroll County without the need to qualify. And the reason for that is because we are a rural county. Uh, qualifying riders uh, is based on age, disability, and access to fixed route transit. And because we are primary, primarily rural, and by the new urbanized zoning standards, 100% rural, anyone more than three quarters of one mile to a fixed stop would qualify for paratransit services, making it a rather redundant and costly endeavor to qualify uh, those individuals. Um, Commissioner Rothstein, you stated that the services sh should the services lessen across the county, the county dollars would lessen. And of course, that would be the case. Less service would absolutely equal less dollars. But the cost of the community would be detrimental. The services we provide enhance the quality of life for our clients. Carroll County is absolutely not a place you move to if you want to leave your car in the garage and utilize public transportation for convenience. Our clients rely on our services to get life-saving medical treatments, have access to general health care, grocery shopping, human service programs, and much more. Um, Ms. Graham stated that there's a lot we could do with transit, that we could potentially cut days of the week, hours, or find other means of cutting service, and I strongly disagree with that. In our rider transportation survey that Ms. Steckel referred to uh, during her comment last week, she shared some statistics. We had three areas that rated low, a uh, low of four, and those three hours, three areas were asking for more service, uh, more hours, more frequency of buses, not less. In addition to those statistics, 49% of our surveyed riders make less than $15,000 per year, 26% making less than $30,000 per year. With those income levels, our clients cannot afford private services such as Uber or Lyft, and they certainly can't afford to lose their job due to transportation cuts. Uh, these clients are likely already enrolled in other human service programs and losing employment would cause a larger need uh, and burden on those services such as housing, food, assistance, and Medicaid. The Bureau of Aging has been working diligently over the past several years to make Carroll County a county where our residents can age in place, keeping them out of facilities and keeping their independence intact. The reduction of transportation services would put a halt to those efforts. Uh, lastly, I would just like to say that, um, you know, as the director of Ride With Us, I think it's very obvious that my concern is for my own job, my company, my drivers, um, but most importantly it is for the, the riders here. They, they mean the world to us. Um, and cutting services are going to take away the ability for these clients to get to their dialysis treatments, um, keep their independence, get to access health care, and things that are super important. Um, so I ask that when you're looking for things to cut, that we really take into consideration what a huge impact public transit has on such a rural county um, and, and really just take that into consideration when we're making those, those decisions to cut. And thank you for your time this morning. 
Thank you. Told me you just didn't like me. No, it wasn't me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, uh, commissioners. Any other comments? Uh, any other things before we start? Um, yes, sir. Ted, can you s present us the budget? Okay. Uh, yeah. That that call. It's actually kind of useful in a way for some things we're going to have to think about. Uh, transit, I expect, will come up as we continue our conversations. Uh, but the points being made there uh, really illustrate the difficulties that we face. Uh, there's very little that we can look at in our budget and say, let's stop doing that or let's do less, less of that that won't have arguments that people can make why we should continue doing it. Uh, the, the question isn't are we doing good things, the question is how many good things can we afford to do? And that always leads to difficult conversations and difficult decisions. All right. so in front of you, you have a pile of papers. Uh, the first thing you have is a copy of the presentation. As always, as much as you want to get to the end and find out who did it, I encourage you to just <laughs> stick with me because ideas build on each other. Then you have a copy of the operating plan with benefits allocated to all the budgets. You have a copy of that plan with benefits not allocated to all the budgets. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. You have a copy of the operating book and a copy of the capital book. So we're here today to give you the recommended budget and recommended 25 through 30 operating plan in CIP. Uh, it's difficult for me actually to call this a recommended budget though because what I'm bringing you is not only a plan that's not balanced but an FY25 budget that's not balanced. And as we've talked about before, uh, as uncomfortable as that as is for me, I didn't feel there was any way for me to get to a balanced budget without making what I would say are policy decisions which don't belong in, in my hands. So our starting point is a negative position. Uh, we have to balance our budget. There's no choice on that. Uh, so we know we're starting in a hole and we have to make something happen just to get to zero before we consider anything else that we might want to do. Core messages, these are the same messages I gave you two weeks ago. Um, won't spend a lot of time here, but just remind you, revenue picture has weakened. Uh, we are overcommitted. We have an unbalanced operating plan. Uh, blueprint remains probably the big concern and there are we have challenges to be dealt with in the operating plan now the core presentation that I have here we've been doing more or less the same thing for years uh, the details change but the basic format doesn't but we've had some conversations re recently that got me thinking about things, and I felt like it was necessary to maybe do something a little bit different than what we typically have done. And it wasn't presented quite this simply, but an idea is out there. So, so how do we get to this place? Why are we where we are? And I was thinking about that and saying, well, it's really a relevant and very important question. And I think trying to answer it in some way will be useful as we enter our conversations about where we want to go so that everybody is starting with a level of comfort, not necessarily with where we are, but understanding of how it is that we got here. And first I'm gonna say that the answer to this is not here's this thing that happened to us. We're talking literally 
decades of change. And I'm going to present uh, a slide full of some ideas here, but I'm going to go into each of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, first, a changing funding relationship with the state. And there's the service infrastructure and facility choices that we've made over the years. Oh yeah, and I do want to point out, as we look back at choices we made, uh, I'm not sitting here trying to judge or criticize what we did. We made the choices we made, when we made them, with the information we had, for reasons that felt okay at, at that time. Uh, my point here is really just to say, a decision got made, it has an impact that still is impacting us, an impact impacting us today. You know? Uh, mandates, state and federal governments tell us sometimes we have to do things that lead to spending that we might not have chosen. Uh, the Great Recession, this is a little bit different than some of the other things I'm talking about, but I think it's a relevant piece of understanding. Changing demographics, a changing world, use of one-time funding, and choices that were made to add expenditures without a plan for how they were going to get paid. I, mean, I want to point out on mandates, well, no, it'll, it'll wait till we get there. Now, are you going to further go into each one yep, of these? Yep, okay. I am. So changing relationship with the state. Okay. This, I'm, I'm going to go all the way back to a recession in the early 90s. And before that recession, Carroll County's operating budget was about 15% funded by the state government. Uh, we're, we're a fraction of a percent now. It was a very different uh, ar arrangement. And I go back all the way to there, just say, you know, that was a beginning piece to d decades worth of decisions on how are we going to deal with these changes. Then the relationship continued to evolve over time, and we can find dozens, probably hundreds of things to talk about. I'm just going to mention a few things. Uh, the state funds part of the circuit court operation, and we fund part of the circuit court operation. Where that line is has changed many times over the years, and we have to react to that. Elections. Oops. Uh, elections. Um, we're going to talk more about elections in some detail later. But this is a state operation that is totally funded locally. And over the years, the expectations for what we're going to fund have changed. I think dramatically is a fair word to use. Fiscal year 10, this was where the Great Recession hit us and had impacts of all kinds. But one obvious one was highway user revenue, cut by 90 percent. And uh, this is probably forgotten by most people, but we were using some of that money in our operating budget back then. And even now, highway user revenue, there are permitted operating uses. Uh, one good thing that came out of, the, out of that recession and losing highway user revenue is we took that opportunity to exclusively use that money in the capital budget. So we were no longer in a position to worry about, can we balance the operating budget if highway user revenue changes? But we did have operating costs covered by that. We still have those operating costs. We've had to adapt to it, but it's a piece of the bigger picture of why do we look the way we do today. And we didn't stop doing roads. We continued to find the money to, to fund our roads. Blueprint. You know, Blueprint is a good example and maybe the example of when the state makes decisions that impact the choices that you have to make. And this is still hanging over us. You know, it's not a sword over our heads. You know, it's a, it's a whole armory of swords hanging over our heads. Thank you, Damocles. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then state funding of our government partners. When the state doesn't fund or reduces funding to agencies that we have an interest in, 
it increases pressure on you and the decisions you have to make, and in the past has led to decisions. Uh, you know, a decade of more or less stagnant funding from the state to the schools and to the community college had significant implications for those organizations and for funding choices that you made. And I don't want to keep saying this over and over again, but I don't want to lose the point. When I talk about those funding choices that we made, it's all a piece of where we are today. You know, once you're funding the schools, once you add funding because of pressure of the state not uh, having added funding, that's in there now. I mean, it, it's hard to pull it all apart, but it's part of what you're doing. Services, infrastructure, and facilities. These are choices we're making for the most part. And I want to say, you know, any one decision by itself is probably not something we would say, okay, that was a problem. It's the accumulation. It's the effect mm -hmm. of all these over time. Uh, our services, it's funny, you know, we just, just had the call about transit and you've had some d discussion. I think this is a place where we should be talking. And again, the point isn't, are the things we're doing good ideas, but I think most people would argue or agree that they, they are. The point is, what can we afford to do? And you know, our transit system started out for seniors and added people with disabilities. And then more recently, we added fixed routes and this idea that anybody can ride. There are costs to doing these, these things. Now, if we were to totally get out of this, uh, there would be a long, complex process because we're deeply involved with state and federal money. Uh, but there are portions of what we're doing that are not about state and federal money and could be changed fairly rapidly. Uh, my point now isn't to get into the details of what that would look like, but just to say I think this, this is a place where you do have discretion and probably need to talk some about this. Uh, collaboration with our municipalities on water resources. Um, not too long ago, there were nine NPDES permits in Carroll County. Each of the municipalities had one and the county had one. Uh, we agreed to come together on one permit. And I think, I think these positions might have preceded that, I, I, I'm not sure, but there are two positions uh, that help the towns with what, dealing with water resources and clean water. Um, the towns pay for those salaries, but we pay for the benefits. This is an example of, of the kind of things that contribute to the picture, but aren't obvious and sometimes can get kind of lost. Uh, there's nothing that required us to do this. We did it. There are good reasons for doing it, but the cost of those benefits is built into your, your plan now. Veteran services. Oh, yeah, let me back up on water resources. The other piece of this, uh, the actual building of uh, stormwater ponds and, um, and remediation we do for clean water purposes. Part of the agreement we have with the towns now is the county funds 80 percent, towns found fund 20 percent. And that's whether it's strictly benefiting the county, strictly benefiting the ca a town, or, or both of us. In, in my mind, a pretty good arrangement for the, for the towns. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, this is an ongoing cost that is built in forever. Veteran services. This is another place where this is totally discretionary. The commissioners can choose to stop this today if they want. Uh, there's two big things that we're doing. Uh, one is helping veterans access their benefits, and the other is providing transportation to veterans' health facilities. Uh, on the accessing benefits, the state provides this function but we weren't happy with the quality of work that they were doing. And we created positions to help people, help veterans access their benefits. And it's been very successful. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that there hasn't been benefit from, from doing it. Uh, veterans have health medical uh, benefits available to them in, in military facilities. 
uh, we are helping them get there. And I think we found that people were getting health care that they weren't getting because we've made it possible for them to get there. So again, no argument that there has been benefit to doing this. But there is a cost. We say what has changed. This is a change that didn't always, wasn't always part of our picture. Yeah, not in Carroll. Uh, this is about fighting back against opioid abuse. Um, commissioners added funding, and there's pieces of this in different places. Again, it's not very obvious unless you know what you're, you're looking for. We're probably spending something like a million and a half dollars, maybe more, a, a, a year on this. Uh, we give money to the Boys and Girls Club for two middle school after school programs. We fund the health department for their mobile crisis unit. Uh, we pay for a, a sheriff unit called PACE. Um, we added positions in the state's attorney's office. And we're giving Youth Service Bureau about $500,000 a year to provide drug treatment. And this is not something Youth Service Bureau asked the commissioners. The commissioners asked them to do, to do this. None of this is required. All of it has good reasons for doing it. It didn't always exist. When we say what's changed, here's something that, that changed. And this is another one where we could choose to stop doing all of these things. There's nothing that requires us to do it. Uh, career M EMS, this is the big obvious one. It's had a lot of discussion. I'm not gonna spend time on it now, except to say this wasn't always part of our picture. Well, it was in a smaller way through Visa, but now it has become a much bigger piece of what we're trying to fund. Infrastructure, again, much, much more than we're gonna talk about here today, but just to give a sense of the different things that we're talking about. Stormwater ponds. County has something approaching 300 stormwater ponds. There's a cost to building those, but there's also a cost to maintaining and renewing them over time. Fiber network. Some years ago, we built a fiber network. This has been a wonderful thing. It's provided internet access and ability to communicate between government agencies that has been uh, a tremendous benefit. Uh, now, we built this with excess capacity, much more than we needed for government purposes, with the idea that the private sector could lease space for, for their purposes. And there was an idea way back then that leasing that space was actually gonna provide the revenue that will allow us to continue to maintain and renew the fiber structure. That has not worked out. All the good reasons for doing this still remain, but the plan we had didn't happen and this is a ongoing and growing cost for us. Um, roads, we're not building roads the way we once did. We are still building some roads, but that doesn't mean there aren't any new roads being built. Every time there's a development, roads get built and those become the county's roads. And it's not just about the asphalt. Of course, we, have, we now have ro more roads we need to maintain over time and plow snow on but it's storm drains and culverts and, and inlets, things that people don't think about very much, but all cost and all continue to cost us over time. And every time we take a new road, we take on a new ongoing cost. Think about facilities now. In a big way, buildings and parks. Every time we build a building, every time we build a park, we've, we've not only spent money to create that thing, We've created an ongoing cost. Sometimes that's about people, sometimes <clears throat> it's about mowing, sometimes it's about plowing snow, some of it's about renewing these things over time. With buildings, we take on new costs of heating, cooling, cleaning, maintaining. Uh, every time we add a facility, we've added ongoing costs. And it's not just the big stuff, sometimes it's the little things too. You know, two things that have been happening growing in recent years. Uh, we've been adding electronic door access to control who can come in and out of doors, security concerns. There's a cost to that, not just the cost of doing it, but the cost of keeping them working over time. 
and similarly security cameras. We, we have added a lot of security cameras and the demand continues to increase for security cameras. There's a cost to putting them in in the first place, but then there's the cost to maintaining and replacing them over time. Thinking buildings again, but specifically about schools. These are the schools that we've built since 2000. Every one of these comes with ongoing costs that are built into what we do now, both on the school side and, and on ours. Now, when you look at this list, you might say, well, Manchester Valley, North Carroll High School got closed. That, that came a little bit later. But even if we take Manchester Valley off the list, this is still a pretty impressive list of buildings that, that we've added. And you have to think about the operating impacts. Again, heating, cooling, uh, cleaning, maintaining, renewal over time. And there are positions associated with each one of these buildings. Now you could say, you know, we're building those when enrollment was increasing. You know, the teachers, we didn't need new teachers, the teachers came with the students. And that's largely true, but not the whole story. Some teachers, like when you had specials, art or music, it wasn't about students coming with a teacher, you had to have a new teacher for the, for the school. You needed custodians for the school, you needed new <coughs> administrative staff for the school. All those are built into our ongoing funding picture now. Libraries, we built Finksburg, we, and we built Exploration Commons. All the same things that I've been, been talking about. Now, Exploration Commons was not a new building. We had 14,000 square feet of basement at Westminster that we put this into. It's been very, very successful, but there are new ongoing costs associated with this. And you are the funder of the library's operating costs. They get state funding, but that gets used for buying, buying materials. Senior centers, North Carroll and South Carroll. Now we had North Carroll and South Carroll senior centers before the ones we have today, but they were much, much smaller facilities. North Carroll is a lease space, so we don't, we don't own that, but the cost of taking care of it and heating and cooling and everything are ours. And at some point, this lease is gonna be done. I think we're probably more than two thirds of the way through the, through the lease now. In South Carroll, uh, for the first time, we built a gym that wasn't associated with the school. And there are things that come along with that. Um, again, more space to heat, cool, and clean. But also, people want to use the gym. So you have to have means of making sure that it can get scheduled and opened and closed. At the community college, for a long, long time, there was always something being built at the community college. That has no longer been true. But even in this time frame, we added things. The, uh, the, the nursing building, named after President Faye Pap Papalardo, the K building. All the things I've been talking about are true of these facilities, too. And then I have in italics, because it haven't, hasn't happened yet, but artificial turf field. And I said stadium. Yeah, this is maybe not stadium in the biggest sense of the word, but we're talking about lights and we're talking about bleachers. Then other buildings, Safe Haven, Cove, this is the old change building, Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll is the second time we built a gymnasium not associated with the school. And we're actually wrestling right now with how do we provide access because there were discussions about this, but this project got approved without an idea of adding positions. Now questions are being asked. Can, we, can it do what it's supposed to do without positions associated with it? Uh, transit, in this case, we're talking about the building. We built this with federal money, but it's our building. We have to take care of it. Then in italics again, because they haven't happened, state's attorney headquarters, sheriff headquarters, and a parking garage. These will all come with significant operating costs. Now, the operating costs, as best we can figure them at this point, are built into your plan, so they're already in your negative numbers. But when you ask, why is it so negative, this is part of the answer. Mandates. Mandates come in different forms. Sometimes it's telling us things we have to do. Sometimes it's about restrictions on what we can't do. And on the second one, sometimes you have to follow the steps of little ways 
there are environmental regulations that we're dealing with today that we didn't always deal with that have impact on what development is possible. Uh, we no longer develop the same way we once did. That has an impact on revenues. Uh, it's another one of those things where you know, it doesn't scream out at you, but when you start thinking through, you, know, you see that it is part of why we are what we are and what our long-term picture is. NPDES, we talked a little bit earlier. Undoubtedly, we'd, we'd be doing something about um, water quality, even if there wasn't a mandate. And, you know, and this goes all the way back to 1972, Federal Clean Water Act. Uh, we'd probably be doing something, but we'll be doing everything we're doing today. I, I don't know. Full day kindergarten. This goes back a ways too, but this is something that changed our picture. We used to do half day kindergarten. Uh, this law immediately doubled our kindergarten population. New ongoing costs. And we had to provide for new capacity and all the costs that went along with that. And even today, we have four schools that haven't had their full day K done, but are part of the picture you have now. Um, school resource officers. This was mandated. We got and have grant funding, doesn't cover all the costs. Um, another thing that we can say is a good idea, but it's not a choice we, we made, but is part of the fiscal situation we find ourselves in. Uh, Body-worn cameras. This was mandated. The cost of adding these is not really the biggest concern for us. It's the cost of maintaining them over time and the cost of all the positions that we've added to maintain and review and evaluate and redact and share all the video that's being created. Um, you could debate exactly how many positions were created in, in connection with this, but if we said something like 10, you'd be in, in, in the ballpark. That's built into your picture now for as far as we can plan. And we made a choice here. The body-worn cameras were mandated. Uh, Car-mounted cameras were not mandated. We chose to do that. And based on a conversation that made perfect sense, well, if we're going to do this, wouldn't it make sense to have the cameras on the car as well? Yes, it would. But there's a cost to that. And you know, all that cost of people, this is even more video that we're talking about that we have to, to, to manage with a significant new cost to us. Blueprint, just going to mention one little thing here with the things that aren't always obvious. This has gotten some discussion, but it's kind of a relatively small piece, and that's free dual enrollment for students. They can go to high school and to the community college for free. But of course, it's not free. It's free to the student and their family. The school system is picking up 75% of the cost, and the college is picking up 25% of the cost. This has implications for both of them. Things that have implications to the school system and to the college have implications for you. Next gen 911. 911 is significantly more sophisticated now than it was a few years ago. It's not a choice we made, though. This was mandated. We were told to do this. This is now part of your ongoing picture. <coughs> Medically assisted treatment. This is mandated care for our inmates. Uh, we might have gotten lucky on this one. Uh, it looks like we might have a match between opioid restoration money that we're getting, uh, restitution money. I said this yesterday, too. I'm not in favor of restoring opiates, so I don't want anybody to be confused. <laughs> um, opioid restitution money and the cost of, of doing this. But it's just luck. Those two things were not built together. They, they just happened to, to come together. So maybe this won't, won't hurt us. Ah, I skipped over minimum wage. Mandated minimum wage in increases. We had no choice. We had to change our salaries to address that. Heidi's just been sitting there waiting to point her pen over here. <laughs> and sometimes mandates aren't about telling us we have to pay for something new. 
they're about costs that are being passed on to us. And we have two big examples. I'm sure we could find others. Teacher pensions. Teacher pension, and, and te this is not just teachers. This actually affects library and, and community college em employees as well. Um, but the pension system was already in place. These costs were being covered by the state. Them giving us costs, which was about $7 million a year, did not make anybody better off. It just made it easier for them to balance their budget and harder for us to balance our budget. And Department of Assessments taxation. We pay half of the cost of the state assessment process. And there have been efforts to get that to 90% in, in various years. Uh, these are state employees, state supervisors doing a state job. It's not ours, but we get to pay half of, half of this cost. In both cases, uh, this just made it easier for the state and harder for you. And the logic that gets used here by our state representatives is, is, is scary to me. You know, they'll talk about these things and they'll say, well, it's really a local benefit. It makes sense for you to, to pay for it. Almost everything the state does in a county is for local benefit. I mean, if, if they were consistently applying this logic, uh, we'd be paying for a whole bunch of things that we aren't paying for today. And the problem is the logic isn't consistent. It's logic that gets applied after a decision is made to give us the money to be able to say why we should be okay with it. The Great Recession, I said earlier, it's not quite the same thing as these others, but it's, it's a piece of what's going on. And one thing is, unlike other recessions we've been through, I don't feel like we ever recovered from the Great Recession. We stabilized, but we never returned to where we were before. And it's a hard, I don't wanna say hard, I don't know how I'd go about quantifying exactly what that means. But I feel very confident saying that that has an impact on our position and how we're able to plan for the future. And one of the big pieces of that was that we reduced about 100 positions. These are positions that reported to the commissioners. We're not talking about the school system, the library, the college, the health department, just people who reported to you. And we did that without reducing services. That put pressure on everything we do that remains today. Changing demographics. We're not growing the way we once were. This has come up in other conversations, but you know, there was a time when we were adding 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 houses a year. Uh, you might remember we were looking at a graph where 300 looks like the number we're really talking about today. Now there's all kinds of things that go in different directions, but from a creating, a, creating revenue, uh, that's all property tax gains that aren't being realized, and in many cases, a person bringing a new income tax to, to the county. And we're getting older. I know we're all getting older, but that's not my, my point. <laughs> you know, the county has a li larger, a growing portion of our population that are, are seniors. Uh, this also has a revenue impact. Most people in retirement don't pay as much in income tax as they did while they were in the, in the working world. That impacts our uh, income tax. And I'm not saying it's as simple as this, but this is at least part of that picture. Uh, some years ago, we used to plan on 6% a year growth in income tax. Uh, in any one year, that didn't mean anything, but over a number of years, we'd say we expect to average 6%. We expect 4% average now. 2% on $200 million is $4 million a, a year. Uh, Somehow that changed on us. A changing world. You know, the world's not static. Things, things are moving around us. Cybersecurity. You know, years ago, there might have been some concern about cybersecurity, security, but I, I don't really remember it being much of a conversation. Now it's a constant conversation. We are spending more and more money on cybersecurity. Uh, probably most of this we could say we're not going to spend it, but we'd only do that knowing we're increasing the risk of other costs coming to us that we would then be forced to deal with. Hardware to software. 
We used to buy a lot of hardware. We used to buy some software. We owned the software. You know, that model is changing now. Almost everything we do is basically renting somebody's software. And they attach all kind of costs to that, you know, to maintain it, to upgrade it, uh, to, to keep us current. And it's really not a choice we can make. Uh, it's just how, how it works now. Um, that world has found a business model that makes sense for them, but increases our costs. Analog to digital, yeah, I don't know how to quantify this, but we used to live in an analog world. We now live in a digital world, and we know there are costs associated with it. Mental illness and drug abuse. Yeah, I don't know if there's more mental illness and drug abuse now than there was 30 years ago, but certainly we talk about it more. Certainly we pay a lot more attention to it. Certainly we are doing more to try to do things about it, and that means money. And expectations for services, facilities, and infrastructure. If you ask any one person, what do you want from Carroll County government? You'll probably get an answer of nothing. Just leave me alone. But we know expectations increase. You, get, you all know, you hear from people saying, why isn't the county doing this? Or why can my friend in Mount Airy get this, but I can't get it in Hampstead? Or we ought to be doing a better job of this. Or you know, going back to transit, you know, uh, expectations have grown. Who are we going to serve? And this has, this has impacted where we've been in the past and is part of the struggle for when you think about where to go in the future, especially you know, when we know expectations grow. How hard is it then to take away something that people already have? Use of one-time revenue. This is largely something we do to ourselves. Every time we use one-time revenue to pay for ongoing costs, we create a problem. And a really easy example I use when I talk to people about this, that people seem to be able to grab onto, is if we're trying to balance our budget and we sold a piece of land for $2 million, we use that $2 million to balance the budget this year, what happens next year? We don't get that $2 million again. Everything else being equal, we've created a $2 million hole for ourselves. It's not always as obvious as that, but when we use one-time money, we've created a hole in the future that sometime, somehow has to be overcome. And where we are now is not the result of any one year's budget, any one decision. Uh, this has been happening for a while. We can go back several boards. We started using one-time money and minor kind of ways that probably weren't that big a problem. But each time we did it, it made it easier to take the next step and the next step. And now we're in a position where use of one-time money is a big part of the problem that we're, we're facing. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. And when you get into your proposed sessions, I imagine you'll be talking about this. We have enough one-time money to fix FY25. Uh, your budget talks could be really easy if you wanted to be. We could take 10 minutes, uh, say, put that money on the bottom line, we're done. There are a lot of reasons why we shouldn't do that, but one thing I want you to think about is we can do that this year, but then when you look at where does that leave our position, it's highly unlikely that that will work again in 26, and it certainly can't work again in 27 and 28 and, and 29. We've reached the end of being able to fix the budget this way. When, when you talk about one-time money um, throughout the, these different time periods, and I know um, what, what effect or what magnitude was COVID money and, and did that contribute to a problem or that was used where it should have been and was just a blip in extra income or, or what? We got that right. Um, the COVID money either entirely or almost entirely went into grant funds. So it didn't hit the bottom line of, of your operating budget. So as it went away, um, we weren't trying to replace it. Uh, now it could be that we hired somebody with federal money that somebody's gonna argue we should keep this position 
and then now it will hit your operating budget. But, but in the big sense, uh, that was not a problem for us. And that has not occurred. No one, is, no one of your staff has, has um, asked for a COVID-funded position to remain. Okay. Um, new expenditures without a plan. Now here, you know, I'm saying just generally speaking, we recognize there's something more we're going to spend here. But we did it without saying, how are we going to accommodate this? And as always, you know, if you need to accommodate a new expenditure, there's only two ways to do it. One is to get more revenue, which generally would mean raising taxes, or it means reducing some other expenditure to offset this new expenditure. Now, I'm going to go way back again, but we're still living with this. We made a choice to start transferring solid waste. There were good reasons for doing it. We were running out of landfill space. Uh, so this isn't about, was it a stupid thing to do? But we, we made no plan for how we were going to pay it. We took on millions of dollars of new expenditures without any understanding of, of how that was going to be accommodated in the budget. Now, solid waste is an enterprise fund. In concept, it has its own expenditures and revenues, but we know as, as solid waste currently exists, it cannot support itself. It can't generate enough revenue, which means tax dollars are used. And if you look at our current plan, this is a growing problem for us and likely will continue to be a, a growing problem. So a choice was made way back then, but it's still part of our picture today. Just a quick question, with the um, uh, purchase of the property around the landfill and the intent of using that property in creating cells, um, is this going to allow us to transition from the current status of sol uh, transferring solid waste into a, a mixed, like transfer less and start using the cells? I mean because we still have capacity available, right, um, in the landfill. Yes. And, and on, so, so we could start using the, the landfill while we're creating a new cell in the new property. Yep. Um, at a course of action that could take place and impact the, the dollars in the enterprise fund, I mean. Yes. And certainly that's the hope. And yes, I know hope is not a course of action. All good. <laughs> um, uh, we need to make, we'll need to have state permitting approval to get this. So one big snag is the state says no, and then, then we don't have that option. Assuming that we are able to get it permitted. Right. Uh, yes, that would be the idea. We're able to expand landfill space, uh, reduce how much we're, we're transferring, uh, reduce a significant expenditure. But between here and there is the development of the landfill, right. which will be expensive. And it's something I, I hope you will have on your minds. We have about $12 million set aside for this right now. But I have no doubt the costs are going to be greater than $12 million yeah. to, to get this done. So we have an operating plus that we can look ahead to, but we do have a capital negative uh, to get there. I, I mean, I expect there's a, a master plan of sorts that DPW and Cliff have developed in- It's being developed, yes. Creating or establishing the new property as an appropriate landfill while transitioning the old landfill and start using those cells to a capacity where you're working a cap them yes. and then okay underway and, uh, and we're not transferring a hundred percent we are using some space yeah. of yes now yeah. we're doing yeah. both yeah I, I just think that the more we less the transfer while we know we're creating the new cells the more money we'll save but it, I mean we're talking long term this is years down the road as long as we have a plan to do it that's all so. Yeah, th this board won't see it. No, no. Okay. Uh, growth of the sheriff's function. This also goes back a few years. Uh, we used to 
pay the state for it to be our primary law enforcement with resident troopers. Uh, made a decision to move away from the resident trooper program to the sheriff as our primary law enforcement. At the time we did that, we were very, very aware of the cost difference between having a trooper and having a deputy. Uh, what we didn't fully plan for was growth in the sheriff's law enforcement function over time. Um, and it was not, it's, and it's not like, in this case, there wasn't a plan. We didn't say we want to go from here to here, but ignored funding it. We just didn't plan for, for that growth. It's something that happened over time. Teacher retirement, I mentioned earlier, we got $7 million of expenditures, but when we got it, we threw it on the table with everything else and said, let's just work it out. How do we make it, how do we make this budget balance? Career EMS, this is one we've talked about. You know, we <laughs> took this on knowing it was a major new expenditure and we had no plan to either increase taxes or reduce other services to offset it. SROs, we were told to do this. Again, we have grant funding, but it doesn't totally cover it. Uh, another one, we just, we tossed it on the table with the rest of the expenditures. Uh, similar idea with body-worn cameras. Remember, the big cost here is all the people that we added. And blueprint, oh, sorry. Yeah, both the, the uh, state's attorney's office and in the sheriff's office. Yes. And blueprint, we're living this one right now. And yeah, I didn't mention, I mentioned blueprint under mandates, but I forgot to say something. Right now, uh, we are meeting our legal obligations. Uh, so. You could argue the mandate doesn't, doesn't mean anything to us, but I, I think we can all agree it's probably not going to play out that, that way. I mean, the state recognizes now that what they're telling the schools to do is more than what the state plans to fund and more than what the counties are planning to fund. Um, now, the state could up their funding or they could tell counties to up their funding. If I have to bet, I know where my money is going to go. Right. So Ted, the, the threat of, and if this is something we can talk about later, you can just tell me to, to be quiet, but the threat from the state of taking away 25% of the uh, funding and education that they give the school system, is that a greater amount than we would be required to put into blueprints? For example, if we, I mean, we're never gonna be able to, 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 to satisfy every single uh, blueprint standard that they have. And so I've always argued that, well, maybe we shouldn't be trying to break our necks to, to attempt it. So if we simply tell them, no, we're not going to do X and Y, but we will do Z, are we able to compensate for the loss in state revenue that they've threatened us with? I don't think there's any way to answer that. Um, we don't know what the state would do. You know, will they impose that penalty? How will they calculate it? On what basis will they say, you haven't met the law? Uh, and 25% of what? 25% of what they call blueprint funding, which might be hard to pull apart from, from everything else. Um, and if the state were to act, it would be because the school system did not do what the state law says they have to do. So there's two different things here that sometimes get talked about. The other is the state withholding our income tax. So the one penalty is if the school doesn't do what it's supposed to. The other penalty is if we don't fund what the state says we're supposed to. And that might get, that might get muddy. And I, I, I don't even want to pretend that I can sit here today and tell you how that would play out. So I, I really don't know. You know, we had um, conversations, Commissioner Kyler and I, with uh, Senator Reedy and the rest of the delegation down there about extending the years of the uh, blueprint requirement, not taking away the requirements because that's not going to go away. But, and we, you know, all signed a letter and we talked to the governor about this saying blueprint is blueprint. We're not going to deny that. But if we can extend it out three years, then it can have a pretty good fiscal impact. Um, I heard Senator Reedy, I think it was yesterday, the day before, whenever it was, in a press conference, and he said the exact same thing. 
but I also heard Senator Ferguson say the opposite, saying that we need to fund Blueprint. So, you know, when the dust settles, I'm expecting the latter to occur than, you know, what we want just because the the numbers. But, uh, um, and then the question is, like you just said, if we don't do it, what's the penalty? Right. So. And I think, and, and you um, said it, it's complicated. It's really two distinctly different issues. The state will actually hold 25% of the state funding for blueprint until the blueprint plan is approved by each county. And uh, they've waived some of that. They haven't held anybody's money yet. Right. But, in, but then the other problem is if they perceive that we don't fund enough, there is the threat that they could hold income tax from us and give it directly to the schools. And they haven't done that yet right. to anybody so. either. <clears throat> but it's too, it's, it, 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 I always thought it, it was pretty stupid. Um, the state and Kerwin and whoever started out by saying, if you don't have enough money to do what we want you to do, we're going to hold some of it, which seems so stupid and backwards. But the whole system's stupid and backwards, so I guess we shouldn't be shocked. And and unfortunately, I'm like you. If uh, what four years ago, Carroll County was told you won't have to give another penny because of blueprint, mm -hmm. and uh, that went away. And 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 we saw. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a presentation on that and and the head of that committee flat out said the counties are going to have to dig in and give more money yep. because the state's given all we can so so yeah it's a it's complicated and and again my selfish side I think a lot of the outcomes people want we're already achieving in Carroll County but that doesn't matter they're trying to fix some other jurisdictions and make the perf perfect school for the state of Maryland, which doesn't exist. And I don't think they're going to change it. I, yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't encouraged by uh, some of the comments coming out of the House of Delegates over the weekend. The, uh, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, she actually said on camera that she wanted to make sure that counties were forced to, would be forced to pay their fair share of blueprint. <laughs> which doesn't make that sentence doesn't make any sense actually yeah, but uh, right. but I, I I think we're sort of hoping for something better but probably preparing for a bad outcome I think that's wise yeah, yeah I don't want to get bogged down on blueprint but just on the idea that if the state extends the timeline some that'll be a good fiscal impact um, I, I really don't think so yeah. you know it, it it eases the problems for a, for a little while but we're still left with the same problem. And unless we think that in the extra three years we're suddenly going to find more money, then it, it doesn't really help us. I'm hoping in the three years they wake up and see some of this isn't working. That's probably not real good odds either, is it? So the big message that I hope you all will take through what we just went through was that we've been through a lot of change. And much of that change means adding expenditures to other expenditures, accumulating over time. And remember, we didn't talk about everything that happened. This was just trying to hit some of the things to give you a sense of you know, that things have, have changed. Some choices we made, many things we didn't make a choice at all, just had to react to what was going on. But all pieces of puts us where we are today. You know, one thing you didn't share was um, our ag preservation program and the changes that have occurred in our ag preservation. You know, we've had this 100,000 goal for since 1980 and we've worked towards it using different tools to get us there, uh, both county and state, and the funding from the county has kind of gone like this, um, and we're still at a, you know, funding, you know, of I think two and a half million, you know, and as I shared, 
I'm all for continuing the ag preservation program. We just may need to take a, a slower approach by taking away that operational dollars and keeping the ag preservation program moving. But that's also a changing situation that has occurred. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good, a good point. And I didn't include it in this section. Uh, I probably would have mentioned it a, a little bit later, but it is a, okay. it is a change. Uh, when I got here, our funding for AgPres was what we got for the state, the match that was required, and ag transfer tax, which is dedicated to, to the program. That's all we funded. You know, f whether any additional matter, wh wh whether it's a million, two million, or three million dollars a year, we haven't always done that. It was something, right. something we added. And it is a place where the commissioners have total discretion. There's nothing that says uh, we need to do that. And you know, some people will say, well, that kill the Ag Pres program. Um, I think it'd be hard to argue that. It might mean it's not gonna move as fast as you would right. like, but it's not killing the program. So a companion idea to this is, okay, so you talked a lot about what's changed, why are we are where we are, is, okay, so where has the funding gone? What have we done with it? And I'm going to talk about fiscal year 2000 to 24, but I believe you could look at pretty much any time period and the basic ideas would remain the same. During that time period, revenue has increased approximately $350 million. That's, that's a lot of money. That's more of an increase, a lot more of an increase than the size of the budget when I, when I got here. Uh, for our talking purposes here, though, I'm going to argue to reduce that number. In FY24, we transferred $55 million to capital. So it means we budgeted in the operating budget and then moved it to capital for one-time purposes. So this was not adding to your ongoing burden. If you buy that and say $5 million is a more typical, uh, typical transfer to capital, that means we've grown $300 million, still a big number. 45% of that $300 million went to Carroll County Public Schools. This is no big surprise. They're about 45% of our operating budget. And in most years, they probably did as well or better than the budget as a, as a whole. Maybe even more interesting, though, is 65%, two-thirds of your growth in revenue went to just seven agencies, none of which are under your authority. That includes the schools, the community college, the courts, the state's attorney, elections, visa, and the sheriff. Now, sheriff is a little bit different than the others. There's a component of, what, of his duties that are state constitutional duties. That's um, prisoner transport, serving papers, and providing court security. Right. The law enforcement function is a choice that you make to give him, and a choice you make on how you fund him. And now, detention. arguably, oh. and detention. Yes. Um, now, once you've funded him, I think there are arguments people would make that it's not your job to tell him how to do his job. But how you fund him is your choice. A couple of things. One is um, health department is not one of the areas for funding? Uh, no. Um, well, I mean, it would fall in with this group, but yeah. the number of, okay. of, of dollars is, yeah. is not. Then um, uh, inflation. Is inflation also addressed somewhere where, you know, because you can compare revenue, you can compare expenditures, expenses, but you also got to look at the entire environment, you know, and what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, you know, federal state taxes, but we're also dealing with inflation. Uh, I did not look at inflation for this time period. Now, there was a question about the last three years. I do know that. That was approximately 5%, 8%, and 4%. Um, we can look at inflation over this time period, but my point here really is you have new money, 
you did something with it. Right. What did you do with it? Uh, but I, I understand you know, your point, and we can we can check out you know what inflation did during. Yeah, the I mean, period. just putting things because it's a challenge when people say, "Oh, we're we we're spending way beyond our means," or we're look at the revenue, how much we've brought in. You got to put it all in context, and putting it all into context also includes inflation, also includes um, you know federal and state taxes, and you know what's what's been going on, like COVID. You know, was one of those issues, um, but the inflation rates are higher than some of the other percentages that we got to just recognize. Yes, things change. The first job I had where I got a paycheck, I made $2.10 an hour. You were worth $1.90. <laughs> and I, I paid less than $4,000 for my new first, it was a, it was a new car, uh, my first, first car. Ted, can I ask real quick, is that either I missed something or something was not quite making sense on that previous slide. Could you go back to that previous slide? I'm sorry. 45% of the growth went to CCPS, but 65% of that growth went to seven agencies. The 45 and the 65 are not 100. 45 is part of the 65. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, uh, Carroll County Public Schools is one of those seven agencies. Oh, so they got 45% of the 65%. Well, they got 45% of the 100%. Okay. And then those seven agencies got 65% of the 100%. So it's really, <laughs> okay. if I, I could have put this. The difference is 20%. Yes. The, seven, the six other agencies got 20%. Yes. Okay. That's another way to say it. <laughs> so the school system got 45%, and there were six other agencies that got 20%. Okay. All right. <laughs> if it was $100, the school, $100 of growth, the school system got $45 of the growth. The other six agencies got $20 of the growth. Combined, or Combined, they got 65 dollars of the growth. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to talk a little bit more about recent times, and all of you have heard me say these are not normal years. Commissioner Rothstein's heard it for longer than than the rest of you. But my message in, in recent years is this is not the way it usually works. It's not going to continue this way. Don't think that this is where we are. And I wanted to give you a couple ways of, of looking at this. And anything like this is overly simple. I'm not saying you can just look at these things and say, oh, I, I get it. But it's a part of understanding. Transfer to capital. This is money you appropriate in your operating budget, and then you move it to the capital budget to pay for capital projects, cash on capital projects. So this is a place where even though your budget goes up by whatever transfer to capital is, it's not a commitment to ongoing dollars. This is a use of one-time dollars. And what I want to show you, and for people who are watching TV, when I was re-watching the last um, presentation, I was reminded, I'm going to be doing some scribbling on the screen here. People who are watching on TV don't see what I'm drawing, so you just have to kind of Hope I explain it well enough. Uh, Go get him, Bob Ross. Hey, yeah. <laughs> if you want a tree up here, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at fiscal years 20 and 21, the blue is all your funding that's not transfer to capital. The red is transfer to capital. And you look here. And you see, it's just a little bit on the top. This is typical. If you looked back 10 or 20 or 30 years, you would see a lot more of this than you would of what you see when you look at 22 and 23 and 24, where this, where this red, this transfer to capital, becomes a bigger piece of your budget. That means a bigger part of the total budget number was one-time spending, not ongoing spending. And, and that's, I think, important to understand. Now, whoops, I'm not a fan of truncating the y-axis, but you see here, I started at 300 instead of zero. I did that just to make it easier to see what looks normal in 20 and 21 versus much larger transfer to capital in 22, 23, and 24. 
Now, I want to give you another way of thinking about this, and this is about how we're using fund balance, which by definition is one-time money. You got it as a result of the end of one year. You only get it once. You don't know if you're ever going to get it again. But there's a very similar picture, although it means something different. Again, in 20 and 21, you see what is more typical, more historically typical use of fund balance in your operating budget. Then you look at 22 and 23 and 24, and you see we're using a lot more fund balance. Now, this is a different story, though, than the transfer to capital. This means we're using one-time money to support ongoing costs. So while the transfer to capital piece was kind of a good thing, says, you know, we're, we're using one-time money in a way that makes sense, this is going the other way and saying we're using one-time money in a way that creates difficulties for us. And I did the same thing, truncated the, the graph here, just to make it easier to see the magnitude of the change that, that we've done. Our whole problem is not about what happened here. This, this contributed, but I, I, I want to be clear. I went through all that other stuff that I did to say there's a lot of things that go into why are we where we are today. And this is going back to other conversations why, you know, we're not going to make decisions now, but to commit ourselves not to use one-time funds to masking the problem in the operational, you know, fund balance. Um, I mean, we're just going to end up masking it until a point where it's going to be too steep of a cliff. And so, therefore, we, we've got to get ourselves around that. Um, we've done it before, but we can't afford to do it again because it's just going to be that steeper, you know, which will be very, very painful for the next generation of commissioners and, and county residents. So, okay. Yeah, so this next section we brought to you two weeks ago in the overview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to touch on a few points. Now, first, uh, we shared with you uh, what we thought our year-end projection was uh, between revenue Revenue change from budget, expenditure change from budget, where we thought we would end up. This has changed a little bit. Under unexpended, for viewers at home, you see $10 million. Um, that was more like $9 million when we came, came in before. And remember, I said to you, every day we get closer to the end of the year, we get more comfortable with what's not going to be spent. Uh, it seems reasonably unlikely now that we're not going to spend a lot more on snow. So we did up this about a $1 million. Uh, don't want to lose, though. We never know when a wind or water event might happen. So this isn't guarantee. This is just saying what seems likely. So improving that number also improved the bottom 25.2, what we think is the end result of all the stuff that goes into this. And I want to say again, I said this last time, but important to not lose this. The big variable here is income tax. We still have half of our income tax to collect. Uh, we've made revisions to our expectations based on what we've seen in the first half. But there's no way for me to have certainty about what will happen in, in the remainder of, of the year. Uh, it could be that it will come in as we've budgeted, which would st still leave us below budget because of the first half of it. I don't believe that's going to happen, but it, it could. And this picture could be a better looking one than, than we've suggested. And again, the big problem is we won't know any more about this project, uh, picture until after you've already made all your budget decisions. When, when is that exactly? When, when is the next scheduled update, you know, sort of tangible update? Right from at the, the end state? of May. In the end of May, okay, thanks. And we have to adopt our budget before the end of May. And then the rest is at the end of August. Oh, oh uh, May and August, okay. Yeah, right, we'll get roughly another quarter in May, and then it gets more complicated after that. The last quarter comes in pieces in June, July, and August. But it's not until we're well into August that we have the full picture. Mm -hmm. So we're actually you know, a couple months into our new 
fiscal year before we actually know where income tax ended up. Okay, we, we shared with you all the revenue numbers. We haven't changed any of this. Uh, just again, you can see that the picture got worse from where we were in the adopted 24 to 29 plan. And, and I'm going through this quickly, but if there's some place you want to stop, just, just tell me. Uh, here you see the existing adopted plan compared to what we think we're heading for. And you'll see you know, the balances, 12.4 million in the hole for 25, growing to 25.8 million in 29. And you'll see a little later, 30, which is part of your new plan, actually is about $35 million. And we talked about, you know, there are things we're still gonna need to deal with. This is all the same things that you saw. I'm um, not gonna go through all, you know, we told you how things had changed from the existing plan to the new plan. All this is in your package though, and in the last package for that matter. Uh, probably worth stopping here, just as a reminder. Things that aren't built into the out plan, even with the negatives. If we add any funding to fire EMS and there are conversations about things we, we might want to do there, that's not built into the plan. Any more funding for Blueprint is not built into the plan. You're gonna get requests for additional funding. Anything that comes your way is not built into the plan. Anything the state or federal government might still tell us. And one of the problems with you know, the schedule with the General Assembly and our, our, our budget, uh, they could still pass something that would be a new cost to you. We haven't tried to accommodate anything like that. And of course, anything we don't know about yet, you know, it's not in here. That's and we talked about the Northern Landfill. We have not built in any additional money for developing the Northern Landfill. Let me catch up on my hard copies here. Slide 45 six, if, if run. that helps. 45, 46 if that helps. Yep. Okay, now we are getting into the individual pieces of what's in the recommended budget for FY25. And then of course, that all the implications that has for 26 through 30. First, Carroll County Public Schools. This is the biggest part of your operating budget. We have planned revenue of $233 million. That would be a 3.13% increase. I mentioned before that 3.13 is left over from a multi-year plan that the last board put into place. State revenue is, looks to be $188 million, an increase of almost $10 million. Now remember with state revenue, things get very complicated. Some revenue is restricted, meaning it can only be used for certain purposes. Some is non-restricted, meaning the school system can determine how to use it. But that's further complicated now with Blueprint dictating how all of it is, is being used. So any conversation about state revenue increase, you need to keep in, in mind that it's not just, here's new money, go do what you need to do. How much of a percentage of the entire budget does uh, funding to schools take up? It's approximately 45%. Can one of you calculate right. school funding as part of our total budget? I thought it was higher. That does remind me, I meant, meant to say, hmm. uh, we fund with this, the amount we proposed, 55% of the school's budget. Now, that doesn't mean the state is funding 45 because there's also federal funding, which I think is about 4%. So we're doing about 55 and the state is doing 40, 41%, something along those lines. Uh, if you add any additional funding, then our percent will be even larger and the state's even smaller. And, and I mentioned that not because that's gonna drive any decision making, but I just think it's, it's mm -hmm. good to have an understanding of what the relationship is. School system has proposed a budget of $421.7 million. Now, make sure I'm getting this right. This assumes 
the additional $10.8 million that they would get from us. So if you don't fund that or you fund something less, their budget total is going to change. You know, things changing, driving their budget growth, uh, salary increases. We're talking about negotiations here because we don't know what the salary increase is. It's being negotiated. Everything that goes along with Blueprint, just like us, they have some costs that go up. It's not a choice you're making. It just costs, you know, if electricity costs more today than it did yesterday, there's nothing much to do about it. They face a lot of the same technology challenges we do. Special education is a growing challenge. And you talk about expectations. I've mentioned earlier expectations grow. For the school system, growing expectations for special education is, is huge for them. Uh, constant battle. And positions tied to blueprint, um, which can mean lots of things. Positions we might need to move, positions that need to be created. Uh, school debt service, up about 11%. Uh, this is about career and tech in East Middle School. Uh, they're largely finished, but uh, this is about the timing of when we sold the, the, the debt. And just a reminder that the debt service does not belong to the school. Under state law, it gets shown as part of their budget, but it, it's, they don't pay those bills. Uh, the money doesn't go to them. The debt service doesn't show up in their financial statements. Oh, yeah, and whatever the debt service number is has no impact on your bottom line because we pay with the dedicated local income tax. So if it's higher, more gets transferred. If it's lower, less gets transferred. Community college and the li public library. I, I have a question for you going back yep. to the public school. So it's already an odd arrangement because they've already come up with their budget when we haven't come up with ours and their most of their money is derived from us but you mentioned some of these salary negotiations um, I mean how so you've already got the one issue of the budgets not aligning for lack of a better term but in terms of the salary negotiations I mean how do they know what they can and can't do because they don't have our budget because I know last year there and this is on this is you know, it was all on camera, but I had asked the question about a reduction in their budget, and then the response was, well, too late. <laughs> They've already done some salary negotiations. I, I, I still don't understand that. Okay, well, you know, too late is never the final answer. This is another fundamental difficulty we have with how state law sets up their process. Um, you know, they're negotiating without knowing what their budget is going to be. And you wouldn't be the first commissioner to argue, well, that's backwards. <laughs> and you know, I understand, but it's what, the, it's what the law is. You know, we don't really have any, any mm -hmm. choice on it. I say it every year. Yeah. Now, from the school's system point of view, my hope would be that they are not assuming that they're going to get the $10.8 million and negotiating on that basis. Uh, but we don't, we're not in on the negotiations. We're not in on their strategy. You know, so I have no way to know exactly what happens there. But in the end, they are dependent on how much money you send to them. So if they've negotiated a salary package that they can't make happen within the money they have, then they have to go back and renegotiate. Of course, nobody wants, wants that, so they have some incentive to try and not get there either. Uh, if you carry that process out, though, and this is where it gets really interest, potentially interesting, is if you don't fund them what they think they needed and they've negotiated for something more than what they have, the state has an arbitration process mm -hmm. where, the, where the unions and the school system will go to an arbitrator who has the authority to decide. And if they decide that more money is required, you can be forced to come up with more money than you intended. You know, an, another idea that you know, I object to, but 
my objection doesn't carry a whole lot of weight. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't happen very often. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting we should be expecting it to happen. I just think, it's, you know, if you tackle this process idea, it's important to understand that that's the last possible step. Okay, the community college, we have built in $12.3 million, a 3% increase. They're requesting another $900,000 for you. Now, they're losing about 800000 under governor's proposal. Mm -hmm. Now, they have not said this. The school system has not uh, the college has not said this. It would seem reasonable to me to say, well, if we get that 800000 then we're not asking you for the 900000 they have not presented it that way, so I'm not sure exactly what their, their thinking is. Uh, right now, they're expecting $13 million for the state, a decrease of $800,000, $1.2 million less than what the current law would suggest they would have gotten. Now, what we're hearing now is that General Assembly might be putting back half of that. Right. Uh, I don't know that that's going to happen, uh, but that seems to be where things are headed. They are increasing tuition by $6 an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, that adds $1.5 million to their budget. There haven't been a lot of tuition increases in, in recent years. And this is an interesting situation because, you know, the school system, I mean, the college will say, well, things are already tough. We don't want to make it harder on the students. And we've had boards of commissioners who basically were arguing the same thing. So all those years where the state wasn't doing much on, on funding and we weren't increasing tuition, that meant all or most of the burden fell on the commissioners to provide the, the, the funding. And this is one of those places where I think it's important to reframe the argument. You know, the question isn't, would it be a good thing or a bad thing to raise tuition? The choice is, do we want that increased cost to be on the student or on the general taxpayer? Which is a very different question. And another place where I want to stop, people are listening. I'm not arguing for tuition increases. I'm just trying to <laughs> make sure we're clear on you know, what things mean. So their total budget, assuming the additional money from us, would be $40.7 million. So again, if you don't add this funding, then they would have to make some adjustments to their budget to end up at 39.8 or so. Assuming the additional 1.9 million? Assuming the additional 858,000 they're asking for from you. The 1.9 is what they're saying what the, would be the total increase they're saying from county and state. Did we do the same with the public schools with the 10.8 that we're doing with the college, making the, this assumption of total budget? Yeah, we did present it from their point, the school system's point we of did. view. Yes. And so we, we told you our plan, then we told you their plan. But with the college, are you telling us our plan and then their plan, or? Yeah, the first bullet is our plan. Okay. The fourth bullet is their plan. So they're assuming $858,000 okay. in bullet four that okay. we are not assuming. Okay, got it. Thanks. Uh, and this goes to your point. So their 1.9 includes the extra $858,000 that we are, uh, that they're asking of us. Uh, they would look to support a 5% salary increase. They have software things that are on their minds and uh, medical costs as well. Now, other facets of community college based on direction we got from the board uh, we decreased adult basic education funding to the match that is required to get state funding and we eliminated funding for the entrepreneurship program library we have built in a three percent increase a little over three hundred thousand dollars they're getting a three percent increase from the state Again, that $1.3 million, this is, not, this is not mandated, just long-standing practice. They'll use that $1.3 million for buying materials. I, I need to mention on the library, 
they are a big part of the state that put together the bill in Annapolis that's anti Carroll County and anti control. They have staff people that have been testifying in Annapolis, anti Carroll County and anti local control in Carroll County. <clears throat> I mean, specifically in testimony, they've mentioned Carroll County. Um, we need to talk about that. Since I'm not interested in paying them to go to Annapolis and fight against Carroll County. Before we move on, uh, the Carroll, you don't have to answer this question now, but I am curious looking at the community college, past funding, the amount of money that's been tied up for the sports complex and the turf or no turf and how much they've gotten from the us the county for that and the disposition of that money if there is a disposition of that money I, i'm curious what what's going on with those dollars okay the commissioners did appropriate money for an artificial turf field for uh, bleachers and lights uh, that project has not started yet so money hasn't been spent uh, you know what building construction's intent is on timing? Um, looking to get a project manager on it sometime soon, but probably would look to start design in that process sometime this summer, spring or summer. Oh, okay. So they're actually trying to move forward with everything now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quit. Okay. Because you have provided a budget for that. For the larger sports complex, though, we have not provided a budget okay. for that. Now, I, I hear that they are planning to come in and ask you to, to fund that. Uh, it's a very, very expensive project. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how we could even think about it, but they're going to ask you to think about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, public safety. And that's all in capital budget. Yes. Although there are well, operating implications. In yes. You know, once we have them, yeah, we have to, to maintain them. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it will work in a practical way. How using the field will work and what that will mean to the community college. Are are any of the potential operating costs in the operating budget, or not yet? I'm either glad or sorry you asked that. <laughs> this morning we found a mistake. <laughs> um, so with that project, and with the state's attorney building. Uh, we did have operating impacts built in for both of those projects, and somehow they dropped out of the, the plan. Uh, between the two of them, it's about $300,000 a year, and more on the state's attorney side than it is the, the, the college side. Uh, so when we eventually get to the operating plan bottom line, it's actually $300,000 worse than it looked like because of that. So uh, we will get that built in. So when you see the plan in the future, It'll be in those numbers, but again, er, the, all this material was already ready to go. And and uh, and I know we're talking more operating budget now, but I I do not understand why past commissioners wanted to fund a field at Carroll Community College that'll get used five or ten percent of the time, and they were adverse to funding a field at any of the schools that would get used almost every frickin' daylight hour and maybe have lights on it and be used more than that. I, I never understood that, but, and I don't know that I ever will, but I think it's something for us to look when we get into the capital budget. Well, that was one of the reasons I had asked the question, because I didn't see anything in the capital budget for FY25 relating to that project. It's in, in 24. It, it, but it was in 20. But it was in 24. It was in okay. Prior to that. Yeah. What? Yeah, I think it was prior to that. I oh. think it was. It might have been before that, but that's why I was curious what the yeah. disposition of the whole project was. But uh, yeah, it it wasn't last year. It was oh, the year okay. before okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, and that that would be true of any capital project. Uh, now, sometimes they're appropriated over multiple years, but once it's appropriated, if you move beyond that, you don't see it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Although we do have a page where you show. All projects right. that have an open yeah. appropriation. In our, in our adopted book, our adopted community investment plan book, you would see there's several pages of all the 
projects that have been appropriated but not yet fully spent. Hey, uh, Sheriff, uh, almost $29 million, $1.2 million, or a little over 4%. A uh, little breakout of the pieces of that. Uh, you can see law enforcement is the biggest, but, but corrections is, is a big part of it as well. Uh, the courts, 400,000, 11% increase. This is an unusual increase. Uh, the biggest thing happening here is they have a lot of court records that are on old cassette tapes that need to be converted to digital storage. And we have budgeted for a project to get that done. That, that won't be an ongoing cost, though. Uh, next year, you will see this come down. State's attorney, uh, almost $5 million budget, about a 5% <coughs> increase. Yeah, one new cost there. I'm not sure exactly how this works, but the Maryland Supreme Court said that state's attorneys have to provide more continuing legal education than we are today. So here's one of those mandates. Now, not a choice we made, but there's something in your budget now that you weren't planning on. As long as that education's not like in Miami, Florida, or Las Vegas or something, then no problem, you know. Uh, I heard Aruba. But I yeah, well. <laughs> um, visa emergency medical services, zero. Okay, this is not a mistake. This is saying that in fiscal year 25, our intent is to be fully providing through our career service EMS. So we're no longer funding the companies to do that. So that's a $2.7 million decrease from FY24, and you see the companies that are planned to be do the transition in FY25. Now, of course, this $2.7 million is not a savings. Uh, the, the new expenditure is greater than 2.7, so it reduces what we, if we were just starting from nowhere, but uh, doesn't leave us neut cost neutral. Uh, visa, $4.7 million, a decrease of $300,000. This is also about the transition. There are things that we have been funding Visa to do, to pay for, that we are now doing. Uh, that leads to an overall decrease in the budget. But of the things that they are, the functions that they still handle, they are getting a 3% increase in their budget. Our fire services, you see an increase. This is, some of this is the other side of, wait, um, well, no, this, this is not the EMS portion. Uh, so this, this is, well, some of it is the other side. Some of what we're taking from the companies, things we're paying for are paid, paid here. Some of this is, is the continued implementation of our new program. Net new funding, this is when we net out what we used to give Visa and what we're spending now, how much we're adding. And when we say this is one of, this is not the whole ball game, but this is a big part of why we look like we look now. You know, $22 million of new expenditures uh, makes a difference. LOSAP, Length of Service Award Program, is a incentive for long-time volunteers. Uh, flat funding from 24. We'll talk more about LOSAP a little later when we get to some long-term liabilities. <clears throat> Animal control, $100,000, 9% increase. Animal control tends to bounce up and down a lot because they have four or five vehicles. Almost six. Six? Uh, five in a trailer. Five in a trailer, okay. Um, 
So they don't all get replaced at the same time, but some years something's getting replaced, some years something isn't. This year there is something getting replaced. You know, I talk about commissioner agencies. These are the people who report to you. And this would have also been true of the sheriff and state's attorney and circuit court because they're on your payroll system. Um, all these numbers we're showing you are without benefits being attributed to the individual budgets. And you might remember when I was giving, telling you what's in your stack. There's one op plan with benefits allocated and one without. Uh, for purposes of understanding how the individual budgets are changing, it's much more useful to look at it without the benefit allocations because they're changing for other reasons. They're not changing because of something that agency is doing or not doing. So public works, almost a $42 million budget. Only a 0.2% increase though. And I wanna draw your attention there. As you go through the budgets, the people that report to you, you're gonna see most of them are increasing in minor ways. Um, most of the increase in this budget is about agencies that don't report to you, not the ones that do. Is this um, increase in salaries, the 5.5% embedded in this? Yes, that is the assumption throughout. Throughout each one? Yes. Okay, each department. good. Right, uh, yes, other than the sheriff, because he has a different assumption. <laughs> okay, good. I'm not gonna spend time going through this, but this is just to give you a sense of what's happening in facilities. There are always projects going on in, in facilities. What they are changes from year to year, but we're always doing stuff. Uh, similarly in fleet, every year we, were, we are replacing vehicles. Which vehicles changes? Um, big variable here is sometimes when we get really big equipment, you know, some, we have some stuff that costs four or five hundred thousand um, dollars. That gets built into the, to the mix as well. But um, you know, every year we go through a process, budget analyst and facilities, budget analyst and fleet, work through all the things that maybe we could do, should do, and uh, try to fi figure out what are the highest priorities, what has the greatest urgency. And remember on vehicles, what we're primarily driven with by is, um, does it no longer make sense for us to spend money to maintain this vehicle? Should we buy a new one? How do we do uh, overall on um, auctioning back the vehicles, you know, to the public. I mean, do we get some revenue to offset this cost or? We do, I don't know how much it is. Jake, do you happen to know what, how much it shows up there? Not off the top of my head, but I can get back to you. I mean, because we, we've, throughout the year we ask, okay, what are you doing with the old vehicles? We're gonna auction them off or whatever. Just curious, the revenue we build on it, has it been a steady stream over the years? Is there a pattern of, you know, the value or? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know, know, but we can take a look at that. Can you go back to um, one, that, that slide, you the 5.7 million, does that also okay. include, uh, I know we do provide some, uh, some extracurricular support to like municipalities and things like that. Does that number include that support as well? Well, this is only about replacing vehicles, so okay. no, okay. not okay. in that 5.7. Okay. But in the fleet budget as a whole, you know, we are budgeting okay. for people and some of their time is being taken up by those, okay. those agencies. And then we're on that topic. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with this document right here and we had a con quick conversation about transit earlier. Where, what line item are those costs? You have to go to the grant funds, the grant fund to, to see that. So that's deeper in the book. It's not in the operating plan. Go to the, if you go to the last page, yeah. there's a section on mm -hmm. fund transfers, and there's one that would say transfer to the grant fund for transit. So just above the enterprise funds and just above the balance at the bottom. And, and that's a, a good point. Um, there are things that you might expect to see in the operating plan that show up in the, in the grant fund. 
uh, and you kind of have to if you don't know it's hard it's hard to know yeah I'm glad you pointed that out I mean it's it's still money but it's you know it's somewhere else because we are getting grants from their matching funds if you will so thanks yes exactly so citizen services 1.9 million dollar budget about a nine percent increase a big part of this increase is because we had a health department grant that was paying for some of our services in the what's the place recovery called? support service support. thank that's, you that's the next oh, yes. yeah yeah which is why you see that 523.8 percent increase uh, we were paying for it before the grant we we reduced what we were paying during the grant and now we have to pick it back up again is this the transition of the shoemaker house to rss or what where's this money so, so the county used to fully fund RSS. We built the building, right. we funded it, we housed only county people there this right. 15 years ago. Um, then the recession came along, the county changed the services, um, and then a big change was that um, fee for service. Um, so if you right. open it up, allow it to be a more regional right. facility, then they can charge um, insurance and take a fee for service. But the county wanted to re retain a few beds that were specifically for county um, residents. So um, the health department was very successful for about three or four years, right? About four years, I think, getting grants to cover those costs, right. and now they've, they've gone away. Okay. That's a very nutshell version of it. Yeah. And connected to this, there is an opportunity here. We have six what they call triage beds down there, right? Um, which are rarely being used. Uh, not that they never get used, right? But we're not typically. We don't have six or four or even three people in them. Within the county or within the region, are these tied to the county? county? So, if we open it up to the region, they could be used through an intergovernmental agreement with the different counties. It only helps us if somebody else is going to pay for them then. Right. No, I, I absolutely agree. So, okay. Uh, Rec and Parks. Now you see their budget well, I, I, I apologize. Just to, to finish that train of thought, again, Commissioner Kyler and I, during one of the legislative sessions, the Secretary of Health uh, spoke, and one of the issues that she spoke about was the um, need for beds. We just don't have enough beds across the, the state. So if there are beds, you know, that are not being used, then that could be a good enough reason to go back to the state and say, hey, you know, why don't we open up the aperture and let others come in you know, but there's got to be a funding, you know, stream with it. So, but yeah, she was very, very clear about that. Yeah, and um, if this does become a topic of conversation for you, a couple of things to think about. Now, first, when the secretary said we need beds, I don't know if she meant those kind of beds. It could be I other don't know, beds. right? And the other is, if we want to open this up with the idea that other counties would pay for the these beds, just need to keep in mind the cost would be the cost, right? Uh, the revenue would not be certain. You know, would some would would they send money? Uh, would they send people and and money? And I guess if we started doing it and we saw five years of we always got the money, it'd be easier to feel comfortable. Yeah. Uh, but going into it, uh, it would be a question mark. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rec and parks going up 28 percent. This is largely because we are moving a function from public works to rec and parks. So a lot of this increase is offset by a decrease in the uh, public works budget. So that's one, of, I was gonna ask that, that's one of the reasons public works is such a small percentage. Uh, yeah, well public works is so much bigger than rec and parks, you know, it's not the same kind of change, but yes, it is yeah. part of the picture. Yeah, yeah public, uh, public works is ten, mm -hmm. 10 times the size of Rec and Parks. 
Uh, Historical Society, 60,000. That's flat from 24. Same union mills at 20,000. Public safety, this is your public safety, not the bigger idea of law enforcement and fire EMS and stuff. Uh, down 0.4%. Technology services, up 11. And that's because of, uh, you see, there's some very specific things going on here. Uh, mm. One really big one is the migration of Excella to the, to the cloud. HR down and what was happening here? Organizational studies. Ah, okay. Yeah, we had money in for a potential study that doesn't look like it's going to happen. So that would have been a one-time expenditure, but it's out this year. Ted, real quick, if I could, um, yeah. I'm sure somebody at home is going to ask the question. Can we go back to Rec and Parks? You mentioned that uh, that changeover. What specifically is moving from Public Works over to Rec and Parks? The maintenance. Is that maintenance. Ma is it strictly maintenance? Yes. Yeah, okay. Three f or four faci facilities people basically okay. to, main to mow and maintain. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so facilities was responsible for maintaining the, the parks. Now the parks will be ma ma responsible for maintaining the parks. Okay. Uh, you see health going up 18%. Uh, our costs are not rising this much. We've actually been trying to figure out what's happening here. We, we think it's a problem with how 24 was budgeted. Uh, we have seen a little bit of an increase in how much we're spending on medical, but not this kind of increase. And. We are planning, uh, we've, we've always been planning for potential increases in medical costs in, in the, f the, the future. And in recent years, we had backed off of that some because of the experience we, we've had. Uh, we have upped it a little, little bit just because we have seen a, a bit of a change. But remember, like, like all long-term uh, assumptions, it gets reevaluated every year. We're not committed to this. Uh, comptroller, 2%. Management and budget's down 13%. That's largely because we have what's called an internal service fund. We put money in every year. Workers' comp claims get paid out of there. We had a sufficient balance that we didn't think it was necessary to, to fund it this year. This is one of those good news, sort of bad news things. It, it's good news for 25, but we will have to put this money back in in 26 and beyond. So, it, you know, put... It kind of takes te pressure off, but only temporarily. County attorney, 4%. Planning and land management, a percent. Economic development, 2%. Watershed restoration and protection fund. You know, uh, some people have argued about pushing back against, or not pushing back, but ignoring state mandates and the What's, what's called the rain tax has been used as an example of Carroll County having said no. Uh, we didn't really say no. We didn't institute a new tax, but our agreement with the state was to dedicate part of our existing property tax for the same purpose, which is what this watershed restoration and protection fund is. Every year we have to calculate what part of our property tax goes to this fund. And, and what part does, because again, which made sense to me when they did it, the rain tax, we'd have been measuring roofs and driveways and a lot of other stuff. It seemed uh, foolish and we were already doing the work, but, but is, has this been growing? Has this been more of a strain on property tax? as the years have gone or, or we're just continuing to do what we were doing before the rain tax was even discussed? Well, it will continue to grow because the cost of doing the things works and we have a couple people here and the cost, their cost goes up. So it's $3.7 million of property tax 
and property tax was <coughs> something approaching $250 million. So whatever that percentage is, 37 out of 245 or something like that. And it will bounce around some from year to year. This is not one where you'd see a nice smooth line into the future, although I think it will increase over time, but some of it depends on you know, the projects that got done. Nonprofit service providers, about four and a half million dollars in total, an increase of 1.2 percent. Uh, they're actually seeing a bit more of an increase than that, but you uh, approve some one-time money in 24, so that pulls the percentage down. Uh, the growth rates that are assumed for the various organizations, and just a reminder, back in 17, the Board of Commissioners at that time set these various growth assumptions. This is just carrying those forward. And there's two slides of, of those. Uh, health department, getting an increase of about $100,000, 3%. Social services is flat from 24, as, as it is every year. Soil conservation, up 4.5%. Weed control, 16.5%. What was happening here? It's not very much money. That was a salary increase. Okay, so it's building in a salary increase. Just one of those things where it's such a small budget, it doesn't take much of a change for it to be a big percentage change. Mm -hmm. Extension up 1%. Spongy moth, which used to be gypsy moss, moss. Um, flat. Elections, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, two and a half million dollars, up almost 10%. Remember, this is not choices we're making. This is choices that the State Board of Elections I is making. And in recent years, this has become a worry for me, they have seemed to have become less and less concerned about the impact on counties. Although one good thing, um, the uh, MAKO Budget and Finance Affiliate recently met with the relatively new director of the Maryland State Board of Education, uh, Education and Elections. Jared starts with a D, I can't remember the, the last name. But he actually asked for the meeting with us because um, there are poll books that we will be required to pay half of in connection with, with elections. Uh, they had a contract that has gone bad. It's gonna delay getting the poll books. They're trying to recover money from the, the vendor and he, he basically asked for this meeting just to update us on what's going on, which was a, a total surprise to me. I can't recall anything similar having happened with elections or almost, almost anybody at the state with the exception of the Comptroller's office. And, and we can't control, but a lot of this cost has to be mail-in ballots and drop boxes and all of that, which didn't really decrease the cost of early voting on election days? Well, they expanded early voting, too. They've, they've yeah, done we get lot. all those costs, and that does lead this budget to bounce around some, too, because it depends, is it a no election year, a one election year, or a two election year? So if you, if you went back you know, without knowing that, it, it would be easy to look at the history and say, what in the world are they doing with this, this, this budget? Um, but yes, you know, every time, you know, if they say you need more voting precincts, uh, a new cost. If we want to add days to early voting, a, a new cost. You know, if, if you're going to do something different with uh, ballots or you want more drop-off sites, all those are costs that come to us. And whatever the salary increases are, that, that all comes to us. And I have a graph on, on here. This is. The, this is the only one budget like this. You know, so I, I felt a little bit uncomfortable that I was focusing attention on elections, but it seemed like it deserved focusing attention. I just wanted you to see that over about 15 years, this budget has gone up five times, gone from $500,000 to $2.5 million. 
So this is another one of those, you know, we talk about, well, what's changed? You know, here's something that, that's changed, and you had, you had no control over it. Well, well, them moving to a uh, hopefully more efficient facility, will that save us any money in operating or probably not? No, because we, we own the space that they're in now. We're going to be paying for the space they're going to. The only maybe benefit is the state will pay for some of the cost of the rental uh, that covers, I think, the um, storage portion of it, warehouse. the warehouse portion. Yeah. So that reduces our costs slightly, but our costs are increasing because now we don't own the space. County commissioners out of control at 3.8%. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that one. Uh, not in Carroll. Talked about that a little bit earlier. This is not all the things I've talked about. This is just the piece that funds the um, after school programs and the mobile crisis unit. Mobile crisis unit. I can I just can't seem to hang on to that for some, some reason. I got it. <laughs> so this not the YSB or right. This isn't YSB. This isn't the sheriff uh, pace unit. Um, Audio video up 5%. Cable Regulatory Commission, 5%. Community Center, Community Media Center, about 3%. And this is not a lot of money, but this, this is another one that can be difficult to look at because we have a process of giving them, we, we, we fund them based on how much money we think will come in from franchise fees. And then when we get the real number, we either adjust to back off of what we gave them that we shouldn't have or to give them what we should have. So this is actually a decrease. And Ted, we're seeing, as everybody knows, with Cable Regulatory Commission, we're seeing less and less revenue from that because everybody's going off of cable. Um, is there any chance that might be adjusted at some point due to that? Or is that just something that's going to be eventually probably phased out if cable happens to go that route? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question and one we've talked about for, for many years. Uh, the CMC is actually going to come into you to ask for a change in how they're funded. Right now, there's, on the, there's a 5% cable franchise fee. Um, you and each of the towns get, gets money. Of that 5% right now, from all nine jurisdictions, two of the 5% or 40% of the revenue goes to the CMC. Uh, they're going to be asking you to change that from two of the five to three of the five uh, with the concern that, that you have. Uh, now, when you go to think about that, I mean, what that is is directly a loss of general fund revenue that you could use for any purpose and a gain for, for their budget. Um, long term, you know, we have to think that this is going to be a declining revenue and to Richard Turner's credit I mean they have been doing things to try to diversify you know a big one has been their coverage of high school sports uh, but at this point it's not enough to make the, the the need go go away so you you will be hearing about this transfer to capital 26 million we talked about this a little bit earlier. This is still historically an unusual uh, amount, but far less than the 55 million that we did in 24. Uh, transferred to transit grant. So this shows up in the operating plan. You can see a line where you see what we're sending to the grant fund, but the total picture is in the grant fund. Uh, and this is going up because we were covering some of our transit costs with federal money but now we are past that and we have to pick these costs back up again. Uh, transfer to fiber enterprise fund. Uh, we have equipment that needs to be replaced this, this year uh, that pushed that up some. Transfer to solid waste. This is a blip in the long-term picture. This is going down because the tons of recycling went down which means we're not paying to process as much. And transfer to utilities, the only reason we transfer money to utilities is there, there are three facilities that serve schools. Uh, this is not 
something we put on the rate users. This is a general tax dollar obligation. And we had a project for one of those in there that is not in this year. Intergovernmental transfer, this is the money that you share with the towns. Uh, it's going up 3%. This is driven by inflation and population change. And last year, they were all happy because inflation was up. So this calculation went up, and everybody ended up, all eight towns ended up better off. In most years, some end up better off, some end up worse off. I believe we're back there again this year. So maybe some mayor will tell you how good this is, and some mayor is going to tell you how bad it is. Reserve for contingencies down. This is not because we're changing the core 1% that we always put in there, because we had put some other money in there as a, in a holding spot that we're not doing this year. Debt service. Um, this is all about you know, what's happening at any moment, what projects are happening, what's getting spent, when did we sell the debt. Pensions and OPEB. Now we have two pensions, your civilian pension and your public safety pension. Together, they're going up $4.3 million. Uh, 3.7 of that is because of the public safety pension. Uh, that's largely, well, there's one thing that's happening is we're coming off a bad investment year. When you have a bad investment year, that pushes up how much it looks like you need to put, put in. But also, we are catching up, but not caught up yet with the big salary increases that the commissioners gave to the sheriff's office and with adding all the people that are going into EMS. Uh, so this story is not, not done yet. See, um, the actuarial studies are at point in time and don't necessarily capture everything that's happening right right now. So it might be two years before uh, that's all fully built into these things. Uh, this will come up again later, but good news, we're in good shape on our, our pensions at OPEB. We, we are um, in a strong position. OPEB is being held flat from 24. And we have an opportunity with OPEB we are actually in so strong a position in OPEB, we could fund less for a number of years. My concern with doing that is the same thing I just talked about. We're adding all these positions to EMS, which are going to be hitting the OPEB long-term obligation. I would be very reluctant to back off of our funding when we know we're going to have to increase our funding. Okay, long-term liabilities. We have different kinds. We have bonded debt. We have our installment purchase agreements for AgPres. Other debt, we don't have a whole lot of other debt. Pensions, LOSAP, and OPEB. There are similarities between these things, but there are also differences. And one thing, when we take on debt, bonded debt, we know what we need to pay, when we need to pay it. It's really not discretionary. Pensions and LOSAP and OPEB, uh, we don't have to fund any particular dollar in any particular year. We know a number we should fund, but there's nothing that, that forces you to, to do that. There are implications for funding less, though. And I just want to point out, uh, LOSAP is not a pension. You know, it is a payment of some financial rewards to people who have done uh, volunteer service for a number of years. Uh, on debt, we are well below our debt capacity guidelines, you know, that would suggest we can take on more debt and not feel bad about it. But I'm going to say that that's a useless piece of information because we have no money on the bottom line. So even if it looks like we can take on debt, we don't have the money to pay the debt service. And this has changed now, but we went through some years when interest rates were really low and people were saying, money is cheap. Why aren't you borrowing more to get things done? I said, yes, money's cheap, but we don't have any money to pay the debt service. Uh, pensions, uh, our, our unfunded liability is up. Uh, on the county pension, this is totally a consequence of uh, a bad investment year. And I have no doubts that this will, will right itself. <clears throat> and public safety also had you know, the bad investment year, 
but also had uh, the other changes we were talking about. OPEB, that minus 36.8 actually means we have 36.8 million dollars more than we need at this moment in time. But again, remember, we are adding a lot of people that are going to be hitting OPEB. And then LOSAP, again, coming off of a bad investment year, uh, we had put some lump sums in to, to strengthen the position here. And I was really hoping we were going to find that we were fully funded. That, that hasn't happened, but uh, I'm not worried uh, about this. I think we'll see some rebound from investments this year, and we are continuing to steadily put money into it. Oh, yeah, the um, visa will be coming to you to ask for improved benefits to LOSAP. Just important to understand, this is another one of those things where the question really isn't, would it be a good thing to improve benefits or not? The question is, how much are you willing to spend to improve the, the benefits? And right now, again, the fund is in a negative position, so any improvements would just make it a, a greater negative position. You know, here we're capturing those 24 and 25. OPEB, you see, again, that is overfunded. Uh, pension is underfunding. And we were, we were pretty close, we were getting close to zero uh, until a you know, bad investment year and we started adding these positions. Uh, low SAP, I would attribute, again, mostly to a bad investment year. Um, this slide does not worry me. Ted, how often do bad investment years occur? Are they cyclical? Do they fluctuate based on the economy? I mean, is it, is it something that we can change what we're doing to try to prevent something like that from happening again? No, what you're talking about is timing the market, and I will argue, always argue against us trying to time the, time the market. Um, if I felt that I could tell you what was going to be a good year and a bad year and what that mean results, I, I would be doing different work there. and making a lot more money. <laughs> He'd be somewhere really successful on Wall Street. <laughs> in Aruba. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and to that point. Um, About Aruba? No. <laughs> on, on our investments. Um, a lot of our county investments in pension and OPEB are in index funds where we are tying ourselves to what's happening to part of the market. We do have some managed funds, but it's a, it's a relatively small part uh, of what we do. And the thinking there is, is basically that um, we, can, we can invest in the, in the index funds much less expensively and often get results that are just as good, sometimes better. You know, with managed funds, sometimes you see great successes, but sometimes you also see great failures. Is there, so would you say that altogether there's less risk with the indexed funds in the general market? Yes. Okay. Less risk, less, less risk and less reward. Um, but uh, we feel like the, the prudent place for this kind of money is, is not to be chasing after big rewards and taking on big risk. Given the need for stability based on ongoing expenses and the budget every year. The, um, also, I think, um, the, this information's a bit lagging, and um, the current investment year has been very good, um, right? Remarkably I think that's good. correct. Yes. As, as saying so, if you had Jenny sitting here, she'd be like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> we're we're rocking and rolling in our investments is, at the moment." Yes. Um, but this is uh, because the way these actuarial um, time the timing works, this is a little lagging. Is that? Accurate, Ted. Um, oh, yes. Um, so going back to some of the points I was making. He was thinking about Aruba. Yeah, he was still in Aruba. Uh, first, yes, all these things lag, and they lag in different ways because the pension we do a study every year, OPEB we do a study every two, <coughs> two years, and low sap every three. Um, and then it lags because whether you're doing it one, two, or three years, it's always a point in time that is in, in the past. 
and then uh, to the uh, good investment year now, which is kind of, kind of what I was saying, I believe we will see rebounds from some of this, not because anything fundamentally changed, but just, you know, we lost 10% over there and now we gained 12% over here. Now, to talk about the, the CIP, when we look ahead to your proposed sessions, I'm going to say this now, I'll say it again when we get there. Often we go through a lot of discussion without talking about capital projects. And we get to the end and somebody says, when are we going to talk about capital? Just want to remind you that if we want to talk about capital, we need to make sure that we build in time because there won't just be time when we get to the, to the end. And I have a few more thoughts about how those sessions could work, but I'll hold that till later. So on capital, kind of a uh, <clears throat> high level summary. Uh, you see down $47 million between 24 and 25. Just remember, capital is inherently lumpy. Depends on what projects you have in a particular year. A project goes in, a project goes, goes away. Uh, this is not a change in how we're approaching things. It's just what happened to happen. Uh, same kind of information, but where's the money coming from? You'll see uh, that local funding is down a lot. And, and much of this is because of career and tech and East Middle School. Schools, things that are built into the recommended CIP. Uh, kindergarten and pre-K additions. Now the kindergarten are the four, the four schools that never got additions when we did full day K. They're happening now in conjunction with the pre-K additions that we have to do. Uh, and that $24 million, some of that is for specific projects, some of that is for projects still to be identified. HVAC, this is ongoing work. There's $11 million in 25. Roof replacement, again, ongoing work. But you might remember I told you that in fiscal year 29, uh, we'll be budgeting for the last roof in this big bubble that we've been going through. One of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me here. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to wait till 29. <laughs> Just, just the knowing it's coming. <laughs> the anticipation. It, it's, it, it, it seemed endless. What's not in there, though, is uh, Freedom Elementary and Sexville Middle, correct? Yes, but we'll, we'll be getting there shortly. Okay, apologize. Conservation and open space, Ag Prez, $5 million. We kind of got a little, a little ahead, but I said earlier, uh, this includes money that you could choose to, to stop putting in without shutting down the, the program. Uh, water quality, uh, not a lot we can do uh, about this. Uh, PFAs, you took out $2 million in 24. We put it back in here. You might tell me to take it back out again. Just my, my thinking is this cost is coming. We're not going to avoid it. I would rather be putting some money aside for it than have to figure out where it's going to come from when the time comes. <clears throat> What's the, is there a total amount yet of accumulated money for PFAS, or is it? There's three million still there? There's already three million in the project, adding another two, so we'd have a total of five million. And so is there, is there a general sense of where you would recommend going with this? No, I, I just, we don't know. You mean like a project that's needed for the money's needed for at the moment? Well, so, so for example, like I'm, I'm, if Ted said maybe, or or you said, or or Kenny said, well, you know, seven million dollars set aside would be a, a f comfortable margin for PFAS remediation. I just, if there's there a grand total in mind that that you know, would, we just would, don't we don't know enough, right? Um, and we know we're going to have to do something at the Public Safety Training Center. I mean, there's no question about that. We don't know what's going to cost though. And we're, we're testing now, or soon will be, at the Northern Landfill. And if we find it there, we will have to do something there, too. <clears throat> so I don't know what the number is, but uh, my, my, my fear is it's bigger than anything that we're going to think about. I mean, the challenge is we know where it's going to be. We're, we know where we're going to find it, you know. 
EPA hasn't come up with defining what bad looks like. The parts per million. So trillion. Trillion. So until they come up with it, we're making up our own story along with the state and others um, to do something about it. So right now we're building a nest egg of funds. So when we need to pull the trigger and do something about it, we'll be prepared. But, you know, it, it's, I think, like you said, you just don't know. You know it's, it's there, but you just don't know how bad and right. where, to what level we need to do something about it. So, unfortunately, I know a lot about PFAS. We should find out. We'll have to I see if we can find it out what the uh, status of the, uh, the class action suit is to see where we are with that. Yeah. Um, I think they're, uh, they're getting closer. We can ask Tim. Um, there's not been recent information in the last few weeks, but, um, okay. the, but, it, but it was supposed to be soon, so it should be any time now. The, the problem with the suits, as we found with tobacco years and years ago, as we found with um, opioids more recently, mm -hmm. and now whatever comes out of this is great, to have you know some restitution of of the money that we we have spent or will need to spend on these issues the problem is usually it comes in a very extended period of time uh, over years and years and years and it is is um, only a, only covers a fraction now with the opioid uh, restitutions um, that is so highly restricted also that it makes it extremely difficult to spend Ted alluded to um, possibly using some of that funding for the medically assisted treatment I think is the name of it um, over in the detention center um, and that may work um, um, but but that um, is somewhat of a, a, a bit of a lucky happenstance um, because it's highly highly restricted um, so um, hopefully this PFAS will be a little less restricted in the way that the county is able to use it, um, but I would assume it will still have um, significant restrictions. So all that, the timing, the duration of the payout, the only being a portion feeds into all this. Plenty of qualifications. So it's not like we can say, you know, we'll have $2 million that we can set aside. We're going to have $2 million over a certain amount of time and whatever encumbrances there are on it too. Yeah. Yeah, it all, it all makes it more complicated. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to derail there. No, it's, it's important. Uh, it's just, you know, it's hard, it's hard to see any really good looking outcome here. Mm -hmm. uh, Public Works, the bulk of this money is maintaining the road system that we have. There is money for the Georgetown Boulevard road extension, and 800,000 public. public Public works unallocated. Remember, this is a project where we, we appropriate some money in the capital budget. So if you have a, something that comes in overbid uh, or something comes up that you hadn't planned on, you have some place to go f for, for money. And you might remember when you approved some changes at the Farm Museum, this is where we went and got the money. So now we're just trying to put this back in place again. And then Market Street Extension, uh, there is already money attached to this project. This is additional funding. Actually a funding swap. Oh, okay, so go ahead. Okay, this is actually a funding swap. Um, we're trying to put cash on Market Street Extended. Um, so we're actually putting bonds on, a little bit of bonds on payment management instead. Is that in the city or is that county? City. Market Street. I, I, yeah, I don't know, I'm asking. So my, my impression is, it caught my eye as well, because my impression is that it's within the town limits and that hence the, the big discussion regarding the Chick-fil-A and the traffic and everything else. So I'm, I'm a Just bit surprised. Yeah, <laughs> I think there, this happens occasionally. I do believe that that property, that's the subject of the, the potential Chick-fil-A is yeah. city property, but I do believe Market Street Extension is a county road. So it's a county road, and its its intention is to s extend it down. I think to Stonegate, the development that's it's between down right that circle. Yeah, yeah, off circle. the circle by Stonegate. Yes. Yeah, so. So go f from where it is now, which sort of. So so it's arch, county. Right. I mean, yeah. County so it's road. a county, it's road. A county okay. road. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that that was my big question, and we said that word twice now, so don't say it again. Um, 
Now, we also, it's just years, a few years ago, we identified the 57 miles of gravel road to be um, hardened. hardened. That's where we put this money at that time because there was a question about, you know, um, the importance of hardening roads. I'm like, well, we did that. That was a very, you know, specific action we took. Um, Three year CIP project, wasn't it? Is that what? It was, yeah. it was one year of funding that we put into gravel roads project, but yeah. uh, we did three different phases in order to address right. the, okay. the roads throughout the county. And so right now we have no gravel roads in the county. It's one. Did they finish that one? So, yes. So we have correct. none. Okay. The last one was Doss Garland. The last one was Doss Garland. <laughs> where, where is maintenance for those roads? That's in operating? Yes. Or, well, I don't know. Is there anything in capital? I'm sorry. No. Uh, I was asking if there's anything in capital for that. And oh, yeah. The answer okay. is no. And so it's all, all in operating. Yeah. Although. I know we don't have anything built in, but just like other roads, at some point there probably will be a capital project to re-harden them. Yes, yes, right. yeah. The, the, the logic of getting rid of all dirt roads is great, except you replace it with micro that lasts seven years. It tells me in seven years you're going to get to redo it. Yeah, and we, we don't have a whole lot of experience right, right now, so we'll, we'll be learning as we do that. Yeah, you know, when I got here, we had 90 miles of unpaved roads. Um, now, some of those actually got paved like a regular road. Then we came down to this 57 or so, right, right. which could not be done like a normal road. Uh, so we've done this now, but it's still new to us. Um, and how they were hardened, we, you know, really relied on DPW and their skills and experience to say these are the the methods for them to be hardened. Uh, so, I mean, I know there was a lot of conversation up here, but for me, there wasn't because I didn't know the differences between one or the other, but uh, I do know that the conversations were between DPW and a couple of guys here, and they determined what the best solution was to harden those 57 miles, so. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I think saying we don't have, Carroll County doesn't have much experience in how they're going to hold up. Yeah, I, and hopefully they made those decisions perfectly, which probably leads to whatever, an eight year life cycle. If they didn't, it could, it'll be five. Yeah. You know, it, it, it won't get better unless we ignore them. <coughs> no, I don't think that's the intent. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's another thing to maintain. Uh, bridges, I'm not going to go through all the projects, but there are lots of bridge projects going on. And just a reminder, we own something around 155 yeah. bridges, so we are always doing bridges. Rec and parks. Uh, Rec and parks always has stuff going on, but this is because of program open space funding. You know, so even, even when we don't have money to put on a project, uh, Rec and Parks generally does. Although there is less now than there was when we came to you with the overview or when we came to you with the preliminary recommended CIP because there's a million and a half, million and a half less program open space funding than we thought when we originally put the plan together. So. Um, We've been working with Rec and Parks to reevaluate the plan. Some things we thought would get done in the six years aren't going to get done in the six years. Uh, park restoration, that, that is tax dollars, right? Uh, this is some general fund money that we put in because there are some things we have to do to maintain and renew that aren't qualified for program open space funding. And this is a relatively small piece, and it's not hard to think that this is going to have to grow over time. And also part of why I, I say I think we need to be really careful about developing more parks, because there will be just that much more pressure for funding that we're not going to get from program open space. 
How long can we hold on to the funds in program open space? Is it six, seven years, something like that? Seven? Seven, seven, seven okay. years. But and we, this came up once before, though. There is some danger, though, even though there's this time period. We have had it happen during bad budget times where the state has looked out to see what program open space had not been spent and right. pulled it back. Uh, sports complex field improvements are what and where exactly? Sports complex is um, the thing out, out Route 97 by up against Hoshua. Uh, so this is a lot of different projects. Uh, we have, I don't know how many fields out there. It's, it's pretty big. So this, this is uh, doing improvements to a number of the fields. Uh, that is to address drainage issues. Drainage issues. Oh, okay. It's one of the biggest issues that they're addressing. Mm. Oh, yeah, and actually, Sports Complex came up the other day, talked about privatizing in some way. Just wanted to point out that uh, we do rent this to tournaments, but this is also uh, the fields for the Recreation Council up in, up in that area. Um, it, it's not primarily uh, about other people using it. General government, um, you know, some of this just the ongoing things that we do. Uh, the detention center, they have an old access system that has to be replaced. Regional water supply, these are the underground tanks that we put in areas not served by public utilities. Uh, so far, this has always been done with land that's been donated to us, so the cost is just the, hmm. you know, getting the tank in the ground. And uh, general government unallocated. Uh, this is another one where we are trying to replenish from money having been removed from this. Uh, land management system migration. This is Excella. This came up a little bit earlier. Uh, maintenance facility. We need to replace the gas tanks out there. Uh, they're, I don't remember how old, but they're old. Piney Run, we're putting back $1.5 million that you took out in 24. Same story there. You might tell us to take it back out. Uh, I'm feeling pretty likely we're going to need the, mo the money at some you point. You have it there twice. Uh, we were just breaking it up so it didn't look like so big a number. <laughs> <laughs> so is it $3 million or is it $1.5? <laughs> 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 we weren't supposed to notice the other 1.5. I apologize. Heads will roll. Was that going um, to uh, AECOM? Is that the dam res restoration at uh, rehabilitation at AECOM's? Helping contractor? us engineer and things. Yeah, yeah they're, they're okay. our contractor. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and there's 700,000 for radios. This is another ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, every year, we're replacing a lot of radios. Now, looking not just at 25, but over the six years, even more bridges, not going to go over all these, unless you ask me to. Wreck and Parks, you see some more, more projects, but again, fewer than there would have been uh, if we hadn't seen the change in funding. Uh, fiber, I mentioned a little bit earlier. There's equipment that needs to be replaced. Utilities like uh, public work, I mean, like uh, record parks, there's always projects going on in utilities. <laughs> Things that aren't in the recommended budget. And as always, not being in the recommended budget doesn't necessarily mean we didn't think it was a good idea. It just falls under the can't fund all the good ideas. Now, sometimes don't, things don't make it in because we do believe there's a less than compelling case for it even if we had the monies. Um, schools, uh, that's a program at Robert Moton. As you mentioned earlier, the Freedom Elementary School addition is not in there. I fully expect that that will be getting discussion. And as we talked about, uh, there's a desire from the school's point of view to turn temporary space into permanent space. 
From your point of view, uh, this is a problem for some potential developments. Liberty High School modernization is not in there. No modernization is in. This is just number one on the list now. Um, Sykesville Middle Edition is not in. Um, again, the school system would like it for capacity purposes. Uh, you have a concern about capacity, but also about developments. William Winchester modernization used to be number one, but moved down to number two now. Mm -hmm. I feel like Casey Kasem. <laughs> uh, roads that are not in. Arrington Raincliffe Road connection and realignment. Uh, this realignment makes a lot of sense. This one is about money. How much money do you want to spend for a road that does exist to make it a nicer road? Uh, salt storage, uh, these get, have been requested for, for years. Um, they're not, not in here. Rec and parks, here are things that didn't make it in. Some of these were in the plan, mm -hmm. but aren't anymore. Um, two things at the bottom we've talked about, but I want to go back to them again. Uh, these are two pieces of land that we own that we could potentially develop as parks. Good reasons for developing them. Uh, I am not recommending them for slightly different reasons. Uh, the Northwest, uh, we're developing a new park, and I'm just saying we need to be careful about de developing new parks. But right now, what Rec and Parks is asking for is funding for a master plan, but we have no plans to develop it. When we have limited funds, I struggle to recommend spending $300,000 to develop a plan that we have no intent to implement. Union Mills has the same concerns for me, but an additional one. This is land we bought for a potential reservoir. Trails have developed there on their own. We didn't put them there. Uh, this is now to kind of formalize something that happened in an informal way. And I'm questioning, do we really want to take that on? Wonderful idea. But again, if there's not money for everything, do we want to take this on? And this has a, another feature in that there, there are a lot of water crossings in these trails, mm -hmm. which means not just trails, but bridges. And if some of this is going to end up being underwater, why would we develop something that's going to end up underwater? Yep, there underwater. is that question. You know, right now we have little reason to think that we are going to develop the reservoir. Uh, the state is not big on the idea anymore. But you might remember, um, Chris came in to talk to you about this one day. You know, his thinking was, even if it's 50 or 60 years from now, if we can't get approval in, in, until then, if we sell this land, we can never get it back. Now here we're not selling it, we're talking about potentially developing it, but you would have that. And we have the same thing at, um, at Gillis Falls. We own that land because of the potential of a reservoir. And we have developed land that would be underwater you know, if we ever move to do something about that. And you know, it's an important consideration. Um, we will never have the opportunity again to put together this, this, this land. And we know that water is not going to become less of a concern. And uh, Union Mills could serve the Westminster area, and uh, Gillis Falls can serve the, the Mount Airy area. Yeah, so it, it's a tough one. You know, it's, it's a lot to sit on knowing that it could be decades before we ever have a final no, if you ever have a final no. <clears throat> uh, Humane Society is going to be, is looking for a new building, a replacement building. This is one of those fuzzy relationships we have. Uh, the humane, we contract with the Humane Society to provide the animal control function that we have to provide. They do things there too that are not part of our operation, but they're in the same building, they're in the same organization. Um, we have not included this at the very least because of funding, but if we ever get to talking about this, I think there's a lot we would need to talk about on making sure that we've 
made the relationship clear and what this building means. Uh, Carroll Community College, uh, we didn't include the Applied Technology Center or the athletic facility. And they are gonna be coming in to talk about these. Uh, facilities would like another building, also like a storage building. Uh, public safety, this would be 911. Uh, this is not immediate pressure, but um, Valerie would like this to at least be visible that someday we are probably gonna need to have larger space than we, we have today. And this connects to another conversation you've been having about taking on 911 for some, some of the towns. Uh, if, we, if we do that, I mean, we know whatever, whatever the amount is, we are adding some pressure to needing more space eventually. And transit building addition, you know, the building we built, we built with federal money, <clears throat> built the building we could with the money we got. Probably nobody even then would have argued it's a building we, we want. You know, there's been a desire to make it bigger. Now, of course, if you take on conversations about rethinking what we're doing with transit, uh, that would touch this as well. But right now, this is not in the recommendation. Senior centers, we have requests to do things at Tawny Town and Westminster. Health departments looking for a building expansion. You might remember we have talked about the possibility of them taking over some of the Robert Moton space. Uh, again, just a, a lucky thing that they happen to be located together and they have a space need and we will have a space availability. Library, they're looking for changes at Eldersburg, North Carroll, and Westminster. Eldersburg being the priority. They've talked about this possibly as a modernization or as a replacement. Uh, this is not part of our recommendation. Um, just so you know, though, there is a HVAC replacement built into our plan. So this will replace the existing system. If they kept the, new, the, the same building and redid it, they would be looking for changes to the HVAC as well. The uh, property on that corner where we were looking at the uh, police station, that's our property, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, we, own, we own that The frontage property. all the way up to 26. So they, if they were to look at a replacement, they could actually look at there and then keep the one open. On the same campus kind of idea? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It's just a, <clears throat> you know, just open thinking about it. So, okay. Uh, Sheriff has some changes he'd like to make yeah. over there. Roofs over two sections, basically. And much like the 911 building, uh, just want to keep reminding we will have to build a new detention center someday. Special revenue funds. These are places where you have revenue, but they are legally tied to a particular use. You can't use them to pave a road or put a roof on the yard at the detention center. So we have the opioid restitution funding. Uh, like Roberta was saying earlier, uh, it's not a great deal of money and very restricted on how we can make use of it, but we're working through trying to do that. Emergency medical building. Bill, building. Um, we've had some discussions about this. We don't know enough yet to tell you how much this is gonna be. This will offset some of the costs of EMS. It's not gonna it's not gonna be our primary source of revenue for EMS though. Community reinvestment and repair fund. This is cannabis money, right? Uh, again, a, a small amount of money and some of it is very restricted. And hotel rental tax, we use this to support tourism. And things can change, but right now our projections are in I think it was 28 or 29, uh, it'll no longer be generating enough revenue to pay the costs of, of, of tourism. <clears throat> so we have, we have for some years now not been using general fund dollars on tourism. Uh, 
that will put us back into a position where we would need, need to begin doing that again. That cannabis funds, the first quarter or whatever quarter it was, it was like $80,000 or something? Yes. So the expectation is about three hundred to 350000 annually? Roughly, yes. Okay. And on that, I'm kind of a mind, of a mind to say I want to see it actually yeah. show up for a yeah. couple of years. Ted, okay. quick, quick question on the uh, hotel rental tax. Um, you were mentioning that that number is going to go down and it's not going to fund. Obviously, I assume with the additional expenses for tourism, um, is there any specific reason other than just the continuing cost of tourism that it's not going to cover that? Because we don't have that many hotels in this area, so it's you know it's not a decrease in that. So I was just kind of curious. Right. It's just the, the costs are rising oh, okay. more quickly than the, the revenue is. Gotcha. Now. Um, if we were to get another hotel, that sure. picture would change. And a few years back, we thought we were going to get one in, right. in Ellersburg, and that would have made that would have made a difference. But uh, right now, I'm not I'm not aware of anybody uh, seriously talking about you know, right. another one. Gotcha. Um, and enterprise funds, remember another piece of government accounting. These are standalones with their own revenue and expenditures, although we know there are a couple where um, they can't actually support themselves and general fund dollars do end up in them. Um, operating enterprise fund, there's nothing really noteworthy going on in the budget right now. But of course, we have the big project going on. <clears throat> Lots of things we need to be thinking about and keeping an eye on, on there. And uh, you did agree to a to for a loan from the general fund to the airport fund to bridge the uh, property acquisition we're going through and the timeline for FAA reimbursement for those those properties and that has implications for the enterprise fund because they will be paying debt service equivalent to what we could have earned on the investment and for us we have to uh, assign some of our fund balance so it's not available for even, even though money will be sitting in the books it's not available to you for another use until that starts to get paid back fiber network we talked a little bit earlier you know there was a time when we thought revenue would cover these costs that's not even remotely true uh, we have seen a little bit of an increase in, in revenue, but not enough to fundamentally change anything. Firearms facility, nothing much to talk about here. Just from, from time to time, you're asked to uh, approve new, new fees out there. And just something to keep in your mind. When we look at how much revenue do we need to generate, it's not just about operations. It's also about capital re renewal. You know, you have to replace the roof. You have to replace the baffles. Um, we have to we have to accumulate money to do those things. You can't just get the money when the time comes. Ted, could you take the general um, unallocated funds that we have in place and put them over to the enterprise to the airport fund because you said we have to maintain a certain balance. Or is that? And, and I mean, because there's four million that's unallocated. If we put some, you know, over in the enterprise fund, would that? Well, that would then be using general tax dollars to support the airport, which we don't want to do. But it, but it's we're really not spending it. We're just putting it there. No, they would be spending it. it would they be are, spending. It, it is being spent. We're acquiring land. Hmm. The reserving of the assigned fund balance, it's almost like holding collateral against yeah. a loan. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Just a thought. Uh, septage going down a bit because of a uh, capital project. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting to people who have weird minds like me. Um, <laughs> We have a we have tension between two enterprise funds, septage and and solid waste. Uh, when we 
create leachate at solid waste. It goes to the septic facility and becomes a revenue to them, but it's an expenditure for solid waste. If solid waste has less leachate, they save money, but it's a loss of revenue for the, the septage fund. And we are going to be seeing increased leachate as we open another section of cell three. So the more, more open cell space you have, the more leachate will be generated. Of course, we never know how much because th that can be largely driven by how much rain do you get. How very ecological symbiotic that is. <laughs> <laughs> and more PFAS could be generated. That would then have to be remediated. Solid waste. We're seeing some increase in tons transferred and mm -hmm. some decrease in recycling. Yeah, I don't know this, but it's quite possible that you know we increased the uh, rate. Uh, ton rate for recycling, that some recycling is now just getting into regular trash rather than into to recycling. Um, the recycling is pushing this down a little bit, but that's a temporary change. Uh, yeah, we have fewer, fewer tons, but um, the big picture isn't changing. Utilities, nothing really noteworthy to mention here. I just want to remind you that uh, they, Public Works will be coming to you to talk about rates for water and sewer and that we have a good handle on what it costs to provide these services. If you know what it costs, then you know how much revenue you need. This becomes a math problem to say what the rates need to be. And there's always reluctance to raise rates or to raise them as much as it looks like it needs to be. But the only thing that can happen is if, if we don't do the rates to where they need to be is something that needs to be done isn't going to get done. Mm -hmm. Summary of the recommended operating plan. You see the projected revenues, projected expenditures, and the negative bottom line. You already saw the 12.4 to the 25.8. Now we have fiscal year 30 on here. $35.5 million out of balance. And without something changing, something important changing, uh, this will continue to, to get worse. Something else I wanted to add into this that we haven't done in the past. Uh, there's some I things. Oh, pardon me? Sneezed, oh. <laughs> There's some ideas that have come up in some of your discussions, uh, many more than I've captured here, but I wanted to touch on a few because I think there are some ideas maybe that wouldn't work the way you think it does and just I don't want proposed discussions heading down a road that's not going to be productive. Uh, you know, there's been talk of delaying capital projects. Now, if we eliminate a capital project, there is a clear savings. If we delay a capital project, you might save money this year, but the project is still coming, whether it's cash or, or debt. Either way, we're still going to need to build it in, into the plan. So I would argue you know, delaying capital projects as a way of improving our fiscal position doesn't get you what you, what you want. Now, we can talk about eliminating capital projects, but there's not a whole lot to, to eliminate. You know, the, other than just regular ongoing things that we have, the only big projects you really have would be the state's attorney building, the sheriff building, and the parking garage. And you have a court order that requires you to do something about the state's attorney. This building is what we chose to do. And not without exploring alternatives. We did try and find rental space, but you know, we're not, not successful. Um, Nothing that says you have to do the sheriff building. Uh, commissioners said they were going to do it, but we're not in the same position there. Of course, there are good arguments for why, why we want it. And then uh, the parking garage, you know, we've had some conversations uh, about that. It might, not be, it might not be absolutely required to do it. And if we do it, there's room to talk about how big a project it is. And that, that's about 
how much of the government campus do we want to serve, and how far in the future do we want to look. Uh, transit, we already talked some about, about that. Um, and this actually ties to the next one, privatization. You know, you had asked about privatizing transit. Um, that would require that there be somebody in the private sector out there who is looking at this and saying, I've got a business model to make money off of transit. And it's hard to imagine that, that that's true. Um, we are spending a significant amount of money on, on this to provide service to people who, if, Think back to what um, Celine said the other day or to what Crystal said on the phone call today. You know, most, most of the people being served by this are, are not going to pay for more expensive transportation. So carrying that on to privatization, you know, privatization sometimes gets used in different ways. You know, sometimes we talk about it outsourcing to a to private sector, which we do already. We have a lot of things that we do that we pay for, but the private sector is providing. And there's also talk of public-private partnerships. Uh, we don't have any, well, I shouldn't say it. Maybe you could talk about Johnson Controls as a public-private partnership. But for the most part, I found arguments for them to be less than compelling. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen. And then there's private, privatization in the sense that government steps out of it and leaves the private sector to provide the, the service. And I think, like transit, if we're thinking that way, the question has to be, is there somebody out there who is going to step in to provide this, this service? Uh, forward funding ag preservation. Not the same thing, but kind of like delaying capital projects. It might buy you some money in a particular year or years, but unless we are forward funding to a year where we're saying we're not going to fund any more, it still leaves you then to figure out how to replace the ongoing funding that you've skipped over. Uh, PFA lawsuits, we already talked about that. And competitive salaries. Um, you know, Commissioner Vigliotti, you made a comment that we shouldn't be trying to chase Howard and Baltimore County and Frederick County. We should just be looking to be competitive. Right, not that we should outdo them, but we should try to be competitive. Right, and... Because we can't afford to outdo them. And we can't afford to catch up to them either. And that's the point I wanted to make. Nobody who has come to you to talk about what our funding for salaries might look like, I don't believe, has ever made a suggestion that we can pay as much as Howard or Frederick or, or Carroll County. Our goal has always been to keep the gap small enough that people have a decision to, to make. You know, there's some point, you know, if you can go do the same job for $20,000 more, you're going to say, I'm going. But if it's for $10,000 more, maybe you say, well, I don't really want to commute. I like working in Carroll County. You know, so the, the goal has just been to try and keep it close enough. But you know, nobody is thinking about catching any of those jurisdictions. I know a, a, a go ahead, please. Go ahead. I was just going to say the other part of that is also all of these other jurisdictions have more folks that are working the jobs that we're working so we may have you know one of a kind where they may have three their their rec and parks may have 150 where we may have x you know it's it's a very different you know we have a thousand workforce we you know lessened and i've rep you know, rep been repeating this about the hundred that you highlighted as well maintain the services. So it's not even staying pace with the competitive salaries, it's doing the services that we were expected to do in the county. That's why I'm so, um, you know, committed to this uh, salary increase that's necessary just to keep pace with the inflation and everything else. I mean, um, so it's, a, it's like a double whammy. <laughs> and uh, We've had people leave for more money and a smaller job. And I'll just share with you, um, you know, uh, 
I, I lived through it. I mean, I lived through it in the 80s when we downsized our military 40%, and we were still expected to do the same focus, same work we did with that 40% increase. I mean, it was 40% decrease from 600 something thousand to 440,000. And then I relived it again when I commanded the installation and we went through sequestration. And we were forcing folks to having to go home, not getting a salary. And people were choosing between, you know, a class ring, uh, proms or tuition for uh, the schools. And that's what's gonna be happening. There's these secondary tertiary effects that happen if we don't continue the salaries because one, people leave, and two, they're gonna have to be making some very, very difficult choices, you know, and that's how to serve our community. So I've been, that, that's, you know, the experience that I bring to the table on why I've been adamant about it. People are the things that make this, you know, Works, so. I fully respect and appreciate that as well. I mean, I did look. I, I know it seems like most of the uh, things in the uh, in that particular slide have to do with things that I've said the other day and said over the last couple of months. But these are difficult conversations that we have to have. You know, it's not to, to say that somebody doesn't deserve the raise or doesn't deserve the the salary increase or that. You know, times aren't difficult for people who are working for the government as well as not working for the government. The, you know, we were faced with, uh, with uh, was 13.1, now it's what, 12.4 12 million dollar deficit? We have to be willing to commit to having conversations about everything, you know, even if it means that we decide to stick with something or we decide to, to divest ourselves of something. You know, having conversations about all of these different aspects, are, it's important. You know, we, we wouldn't be doing our job as commissioners if we weren't willing to have those discussions. So I take the points that you made, but I certainly do not, um, you know, do not regret raising the topics for discussion. Yeah, and on, and on that point, I just want to be clear. Obviously, you have to talk about salary increases. I was just, my, my point was I didn't want to leave an idea hanging out there that we had any idea of outdoing or even catching up. To oh, no, no, directions. no, I, I, let me be clear about that as well. Nobody in, you know, formally has ever come to me to say we need to, to outdo anybody. In private conversations, I've, I've gotten comments that, well, maybe if we, you know, brought this department up or did this, we might be able to, to get on an even keel or even to exceed somebody. But that, you know, those are private conversations. And, you know, my point of bringing that up was that, uh, to, to reinforce what I had said to those individuals, that there's no way we're ever going to be able to outdo a Montgomery County or a Frederick County. And that, you know, decisions to, to work here mean that we have to keep salaries in a competitive range. And then as you had said, and as Commissioner Rossing had hinted at, that there are, other, uh, there are other benefits and other reasons to work for the county. And again, let me be very, very clear, because I know this is a very, very uh, uh, important topic. You know, we have incredible employees, but the question always comes down to how much can we do with the limited resources that we have to be as just as we can toward the people who provide necessary services for the county. And uh, you know, I do not, uh, you know, it's not a fun conversation to have, but it's a necessary conversation to have. Commissioner yep. Garen, you start yeah, so, so on that topic, I know last year this was a very pertinent discussion regarding the salary increases. and the cost associated with maybe like a half a percentage increase. So do we know those numbers? Yeah, a percent is something 670,000 or so. Like How much, I'm sorry? I think it's about 670,000. Okay. And um, this, this, kind of, this, this topic of, of positions and losses and gains and things like that, 100 positions since the Great Recession. By my count, my own research, we've added 88 county positions since 2015. That's not including fire and EMS. So maybe somebody could look into that for me and set the record straight on the number of positions because we have added positions since that time. Yeah, it's not an easy comparison to, to make. Um, now we can go back to fiscal year 10 and you'd easily be able to see the, the change. Uh, some of those positions that were eliminated came back, many haven't. We have added other positions, but when you're looking at the, if you're looking at the total positions, I mean, that does include the sheriff and the state's attorney and, and the circuit court, and uh, depending on when you want to look, fire, fire and EMS. Um, so there, there's no easy way 
to look at back then and now and get the comparison, it, it's, it, it'd be a more complicated analysis. Well, I th it seems to be an issue, so I'm, I'd like to understand it more. And I know we have vacancies all the time, too, by the way. I mean, I don't know. I don't count them up. I get them in the emails, but that's always an issue. But that's, there's always going to be a transitory number. Well, this isn't about vacancies. This is about authorized positions. Yeah, yeah. Well, that as well. But um, I, it seems like those numbers don't jive with me. I'd like to understand them a little bit. We'll be better. receiving more information on Thursday. Okay, yeah. okay. thanks. So um, vacant positions in this building, um, is, is the funding to pay those people in the operating budget? Yes. Uh, we don't budget for turnover. Some jurisdictions do. Uh, and we could, mm -hmm. and it would help the bottom line some. The trade-off is a loss of flexibility. And over, over the time we talked about, we have squeezed a lot out of the budget. Uh, the amount, the flexibility, when I say flexibility is money we budgeted that don't end up spending, that ends up being surplus or fund balance. Uh, that's one of the last places uh, that is actually driving that money, driving that number. But do we ever have less than 8% vacancy? Or ten percent vacancy. Um, I'm I mean, sure there's an answer to that question, but yeah, I, I don't have it. Right. So, because if there's a pattern where we know that there's been years with ten percent, let's just use simple numbers, vacancy all the time, then we could look at doing this with five percent of the funds. Yeah, we absolutely can. So, I mean, yes, it limits the fl the flexibility, but. We still have that 5%, you know. Yes. Um, it would be a perfectly appropriate budgeting uh, approach. My concern would just be, and, and again, you have to put aside these last three, three years because they've been strange years. Um, and we've had times where we ended a percent right. off, of, off of budget. So you, you squeeze out the last few places, and then you start to to open up a greater possibility that in a given year, you're in a position where you're not gonna be able to balance at the end of the year, and then you have to, you have to do something about that. Hmm. So you have a bunch of stuff. I already told you uh, what you have. And then just a reminder, two different op plans. One allocates the, the benefits to each agency, one does not. I, I would say to you, the one that does not allocate them is more useful to you than, than the other. It's not what will eventually be in the budget, but it shows you what's actually ch happening to that agency and on money they can spend on services. Uh, the 26th and 28th, you have agency hearings. Um, what everybody has been told is don't show up unless you're coming to specifically ask for something that's not in the recommendation. Uh, boards of commissioners are often unhappy with how long people talk. I've said it before, but I'll say it to you again. I believe that's in your hands. If they're talking too long, tell them to get out. Uh, we have proposed sessions set up. You see all the, the dates. Um, some of those are morning and afternoon. Some might be one or the other. There's one of those days, April 9th, I think, where you all want to go to the Boys and Girls Club at Hampstead in between, which is going to cut into what we were expecting. Um, it's often not enough time. And I said earlier, right, we could talk some about a, a, approach. I know there's been concerns about you know, how we work through this and time spent not accomplishing anything about the CIP not being done. Um, of course, I, I don't get to control your decision making, but I can build more structure into this if you would like me to, to try to push you down the path more qu quickly. Uh, there was a time when I did, uh, a few boards ago, they chose to go their own, own way, which kind of leaves us, you know, 
where, where we are now. Um, <laughs> we're willing to do whatever we need to do to help you effectively use this time. And if that's saying, okay, Ted, set up an agenda for us, set up a list of things to, to do, tell us what to take up first, you know, I'm, I'm willing, but that's, I don't think I get to tell you to do that. I just, I need to know, you know, if you would, if you would like that. Um, and using the time as efficiently as we can is important because it's almost never enough time. Oh, yeah, I mentioned capital earlier. Um, if there are things in capital you want to talk about, I think we need to make sure that there's a spot to talk about it, not just hope that there's time at the end. Yeah, I, I think, um, and we probably need to talk about some stuff in capital. I thought last year and, and even today some, we tend to jump back and forth between something that's in capital and something that's in operating. And uh, obviously, cutting and adding in the two different budgets doesn't have effect on the other budget. Um, would, would we be better off to, uh, are we more efficient to talk about them separately and have a specific session to talk about capital? Or, and I know, uh, and I'm, as, as some people to my left would say, I'm old. Um, you know, you, something pops into your head about a project, or, or like for me, uh, Sykesville and Freedom Elementary pops into my head. I want to talk about it, but I don't have any problem saying, "Well, we're going to talk about the capital budget next Tuesday or whatever." I don't, I don't know what's the most efficient use of our time. Yeah, we definitely can try to approach them in different sessions. Although inevitably, there will be some back and forth because a capital project will create some operating impact, and if you're using cash for a capital project and it's hitting your, your operating budget. And on things that pop into your mind, uh, you know, we can keep a list. You know, if somebody says, now's not the time, but I want to talk about X, you know, we can keep a list and when we yeah. come back, we can say, here are things you said you wanted to talk about that we haven't talked about mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, and maybe that would, yeah. maybe that would make our time better spent to say, yeah, okay, we'll make a list and we'll talk about that. But you're right, there's sometimes they do, you know, if we need to talk about the sheriff's building and will it be bond money or will it be, you know, or will pieces be and all that, it, it relates to both. But it doesn't have as much impact as other things. Right. So what are for the first couple of proposed work sessions that we have? I mean, this is certainly going to fall on us to, to do a little bit of homework. To give Ted certain topics that we want to discuss, and then he can translate those topics into some kind of a schedule for those first couple of work sessions. The last couple of work sessions we can leave open-ended because if there's unfinished business or there are other things we want to talk about in a more, uh, uh, I don't know. Fluid or free fluid, form. Free form kind of way we can do that. But the first couple of, of work sessions to get ourselves oriented and, and to, to stick to task, maybe that's a way to proceed with the first couple that are structured and the last couple that are open. Does that make any, does that, is that helpful at all? If we give you things in advance or? Absolutely. Um, and we're willing to go at it any way that makes sense for, for you all. I mean, our, our goal is to get, success, successfully get you to the result, you know. So whatever, whatever makes it easier for for you, um, you know, we'll we'll go that way. I just need to, if you have. Again, this is one of those individual versus board. If the board says, okay, we want to approach it this way, then we'll we'll set it up that way. Well, I mean, so then I'll I'll open up to my fellow commissioners. I mean, is that something that is amenable to everybody here that we try to structure the first couple of sessions to make sure we hit a couple of things and then let things uh, open up a bit more after that? Um, I don't know. Sure. I, I mean, I I'll just I have I'm formulating what I think I we need to do in my head already, so I'll make sure I share that with the four of you because I think that's probably just as important as that the four, the five of us sort of sit there individually and decide what we're willing to do and what we're willing not to do and throw that on the table. I think that's m more important than anything else. So 
I'll be formulating my plan for FY25, and I'll be sharing it with the four of you. But uh, sure, in the, in the short term, that's if we have some lingering questions and things like that, then that would probably be the time to address them. Is let's get that let's get that done early on. I'd like to see us talk about EMS quickly. For one thing, it's it's over thirty million dollars that wasn't in the budget three or four years ago. Um, that nobody seemed to want to plan for. But more importantly, and Commissioner Gare and I have talked about it, there's some things that may be in open we'd like to propose happen this year, but we can't do that unless we know if it's ongoing money, we need to know it's what we're thinking about for the budget moving forward to make sure um, whatever we want to bring up this year is funded the next throughout the budget the next five years, six years. So I'd like to see us talk about that sooner rather than later to so we can make some maybe some things happen. I would agree. It seems like the the two biggest issues we're gonna have to grapple with are fire and EMS and the and the school system budget, which I recommend we we, we probably tackle first for various reasons. So I that makes sense to me. Do we want to tackle that before or after, and there's logic to both ways of our joint meeting with them. When, what I mean, day is the joint meeting with the Board of Ed? That, that is in April, right, I think? I, forget. I don't remember. I don't remember. We'll find out. I'll let Sometime. you know. Sometime. <laughs> but, but uh, and, and again, um, we, can, we can look at the date, but do we want to try to have our talk and maybe that generate topics for the joint meeting or do we want to wait and see what they say at the joint meeting and uh, I can see logic in both yeah I suspect that their request to you isn't going to change either way. <laughs> it's been about up front. Exactly. I, I say let, let's do it up front I mean those two fire EMS and yep. schools is the biggest chunk so yeah you know, no. so if we do that on April 2nd that would be you know a good target I because the agency sessions one o'clock on the 10th of we April. need to do those re regardless of the topics and that may help us decide on other topics right, right. So joint meeting is scheduled currently with the Board of Education at one o'clock on the 10th of April which is yeah. a Wednesday okay okay Thank but you. I mean the world is listening so if people know we're gonna be talking fire EMS and schools on the second then it's in their best interest to feed us any information they'd like to prior to us sitting down in a work session. So, yeah, as we look at the schedule, just a reminder that there's very little flexibility in this, and they're all working kind of up to the second almost mm -hmm. to, to make this happen. Uh, we were literally still working this morning on this this presentation. And it will it will remain that way. And as we go through the proposed sessions, you know, a lot of stuff will emerge that creates. Okay, we need to know how this is going to work or what what this means, and we're trying to make those things happen in time for the, for the next session. And then as you go further, you know, we we're have you releasing your proposed budget on the twenty third? Um, I immediately follow that with five community meetings to share your budget. And the public hearing on May the 6th and all those dates are backing down from when we have to be done mm -hmm. you know you have your adopted sessions scheduled for 14th and 16th with adoption on the 21st now we have to adopt before the last day of, of May we also need to keep in mind I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday Commissioner Roush used to like to ask what's what's the drop dead date when what's the last second we can make a decision I said, well, there's two ways of thinking about that. You know, one, uh, you know, at 1159 on May 30 or 31st, whatever. 31st. 31st. But if you make decisions that change something, we've got to change stuff, and you need time to be able to, to do that. And that remains true uh, through this process. And some changes that seem like, well, that's not that big a deal. If you understand the mechanics of how it all works, it's a bigger deal than you think it is and, and just takes time to, to make it happen. So uh, big, big 
thing there is there's just not Senator much room Boone. in in the pro, in the and process. we must have done okay today nobody threw anything i didn't see any bad bad faces <laughs> so did we do okay oh, they, they were all drugged before we came in <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, commissioners? The uh, I just say the, the agency sessions because I know we're probably going to have a number of them coming at us. I think we should set a limit for 15 minutes per presentation because anything beyond that may not give others the ability to to have a say or might you know because again, like I said last week, if somebody comes in and they're talking for three hours at the end of the day, does that mean somebody gets yeah you know, 10 minutes? I, I concur. Hopefully, they bring some visual aids as well because that always helps to yes. move the discussion along. But I would concur with that. Yeah, and looking ahead to the agency hearings, we have binders. Well, they're here. Over, over here with all the agency stuff in it. Would, would you like those now? Would you rather yes, get please. them when the time comes? I'd like mine now. I'd like to get a, a head up on them before. So. Okay, let me change that then. Who would like theirs now? <laughs> sure. Well, it's either that or you're going to put this stuff in the binders either way. If I put this here, will you just put it in the binder or... You tell me. I mean, we can. Sure. Okay. It's got the nice holes in it, so it's I know like it goes in the binder. Yeah. Huh? yeah, I'm okay. I've got my recycled yeah. blue folder from somewhere. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, all of you. I know this is not an easy thing. Not just putting the budget together, but dealing with us. I, I <laughs> thank, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll exclude sure. everybody else as a matter of politics. Dealing with me. Thank you for your patience dealing with me. Seriously? Yeah, Do seriously. we need a motion to adjourn? Yes. For yes. So, so moved. Right. Second. A second? Second. Oh, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you.